114, Brian. Lucky 114. I've got levels. You've got levels. Levels. That's right. <laughs> That's not weird at all. Frog throat time. Okay. We've got lights. We've got characters. We've got volume. That is literally all we can possibly have. What more could you want? I life? mean, maybe some competence and some knowledge, but, you know, <clears throat> well, I think people we'll know what they're getting now. at this point. Yeah. Uh, if you're still watching at this point, then you know what you're in for. Though we still get new people to watch these. It never ceases to amaze me. Did the light rearranging get you too hot? Or are you still okay, temperature-wise? I don't think it's going to be a temperature thing. It's just like, it's brighter in my oh, eyes. Oh, no, I'm talking about like the sweater. You usually... Uh, oh, the sweater is going to make me hot for okay. sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's the end Especially because the... this sweater is thick. I know that one is. This one is like... Yeah. Yeah. It's not like an Afghan where it like lets air through. Right. This one traps the heat. So, it's all right. It's nothing like any time in the summer so we'll be fine all right you ready to do it yes okay okay i think i think what i'm ready what do i do with my hands i think i'm ready <laughs> i need two mugs <laughs> <laughs> all right let's do it <clears throat> i feel a little phlegmy oh okay. no tell me more it's all right no i won't you'll hear about it in the podcast Welcome, everybody, to episode number 114 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about the perfect pen for the average user, and if that even exists. If it's a myth that fountain pen nibs naturally broaden over time, um, my version of the fountain pen draft from episode 110, which you and Adrian did. That's right. Uh, what exceptions Drew has to his three pen rule? Because every rule needs an exception, Drew. According to some people, yes. Yes, according to me. Um, how much tipping is on each nib size? And if that affects what a nib professional can do with it, we're going to spotlight the Pelican M600 Glauco Combon, and we'll share about our Thanksgiving adventures since we were off last week. So it should be a fun one today, and we'll kick it off with some feedback. Brian, uh, we have a heavy dose of feedback this episode. I feel like last okay. one we kind of took it easy because uh, we wanted to keep it short. Yeah. This time, though, we got, we've got some beefy feedback. We're going to keep and it long today. <laughs> the first bit of beefy feedback comes from... Uh, Berlina Strassman, an hour and 46 minutes of fountain pen and ink geeking is what I needed this week. <laughs> with all the terrible things happening, it is comforting to focus on enjoyable stuff with these two fun, positive pen geeks. Thank Yay. you. We Thank try you. to be fun. Yeah, I think that uh, <laughs> all of us need a bit of respite here and there. Yeah. And honestly, this yeah. is nice for us too. Like, you know, it is. Our, we have a very nice job, but there are days where we come in here and we're like, you know what? It's just, let's just do the pen cast and it's yeah. fine. This, this is a chill moment for us as well. Definitely. So we appreciate it. And we appreciate the opportunity that all of you allow us yeah. to do. So I enjoy, I actually enjoy the prepping too. Yeah. Like it's fun for me to do all my deep dives and research and yeah. just kind of get back in the, the zone and the saddle a little this, bit. This, yeah. Cause it's you, especially like you don't get a lot of like, you know, you're running a business, not every aspect of your yeah. job. Sur is surrounding fountain pens. So you're jumping into a pen cast is like hanging out with pen friends and, you, and finally just, you know, getting some time to play with pens and, you know, actually yeah. do the thing you love. I mean, not like running a business isn't a love, but it's a different, it's a different love. Different yes. kind of love, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cole 6800 says simply, to everyone reading in the YouTube comment section, have a great weekend. And I will say, this thing got l probably the most thumbs up of any comment. That's awesome. And I just, I <laughs> wanted to read Cole saying to everyone in the comments, have a great weekend because it just, again, and I've said this before, I'm not going to stop. The comments that we get on YouTube are unreal. The positivity, the kindness, the yeah. people that jump in like Cole here just to say hi, just to be thankful and grateful and it gives, sweet. It's just gives me hope for the internet. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> it really is terrific. And mm. I'm just so flattered that we happen to have, you know, facilitated that in some way, shape, or Very form. Cool. Very cool. Um, and then uh, let's see. I'm going to say K.E. Avalasso or Key Velasso says, 
uh, on Drew's zebra question an expanded answer. Their patterns are meant to make it difficult for a predator to pick out an individual from a herd. Mm. They all blend together with their pattern. Okay. So that is why they have stripes. So it's not about camouflaging in with their surroundings. Right. Per se. With each other. Yeah. They blur. Say, most animals are pretty colorblind. So the fact that it's black and white stripes versus like a tiger stripe, I don't think it makes as much of a difference as it does to us. Cause Probably not. They stick out more to us humans. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why tigers are striped? I don't know. That's probably more camouflage. That is camouflage, yeah. so that they can sneak up on yeah. prey like zebras. Yeah. So the orange probably does matter there. Yeah, I think they actually yeah. blend into their yeah. Um, and then finally, this is a, this is a this is a lengthy one, but I appreciated it. Uh, okay. Burnham says, "Hi, Brian and Drew. I started getting into fountain pens earlier this year in the summer and found you guys through a recommendation from someone." The pen casts have brought me joy with your blend of entertainment and fountain pen education. I frequently re-watch your podcast and write down the pen cast episode number so I can reference where I heard certain tips or recommendations from. Smart. The most inter interesting topics come from your knowledge about retail, distribution, and manufacturing. Oh. These topics are very helpful in helping relatively new people like myself understand things like cost, managing mm. expectations, and the difference between buying from a retailer versus a third-party seller. It thrills me to see an industry where people are, where, sorry, it thrills me to see an industry where products are made by passionate people for passionate people. Mm. As with any hobby, I've had my frustrations, but ultimately I'm very content with my pen experiences and I've enjoyed <clears throat> this cozy corner of the internet. I thought that was great for a couple of reasons. Obviously, mm. I'm glad that, you know, um, uh, Burnham here found us. And uh, I also thought it was interesting that uh, we have, uh, in some way helped educate regarding, you know, in this Amazon dominated world that we live in, mm -hmm. uh, helped illustrate the advantages and hopefully some reasons to buy from uh, retailers like ourselves and like some of the other wonderful fountain pen stores out there in the industry and why we provide a different experience. So that's nice to see. That is cool. Yeah. And you're speaking to the probably 90 or percent of the things that I do that really don't have anything specifically to do with pens, but it's the whole retail chain and distribution, manufacturing, marketing, whatever. Um, yeah. Contract reviewing security. At systems, least one person appreciates all this it. stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad that you enjoy hearing about I that. I don't think we're ready to hear about <laughs> insurance or anything quite yet, but you know, so you can keep that to yourself. Yeah, We had to renew our but cyber liability I insurance. I don't want to hear and it. Keep that to yourself, Brian. Our business property insurance and security system. You know, all these things. It's Quiet, really you. exciting. <laughs> really exciting. Um, okay, I got some feedback too. A big old chunk of it. Uh, so uh, Joan Worthman says, I always include figuring the cost of nib tuning in any purchase. And so far I've been lucky, lucky including Visconti pens, maybe because I'm a nib chameleon. But being so, being also lazy, I had Gina change a zoom nib into a cursive italic, which is practically a dream pen being she made it smooth and wet for me. That said, if I truly wanted a personalized pen, I would take it to a pen show where the nibmeister could double check with me how it wrote. The problem is if I went to a pen show, I might bankrupt myself with uh, what with the I want impulse working over time. That's a concern. I say that is real. Yeah. That is a real um, temptation. For those of you who might be curious, Nib Chameleon is a reference to an earlier pen cast where we <laughs> described if you kind of adapt to the pen rather than, you know, only choosing pens that are already the way you want them, yeah. we refer to you as a Nib Chameleon, which Brian mm -hmm. and I both consider ourselves to be. Oh, yeah. And uh, Gina, as mentioned here by Joan, um, is Gina of Custom Nib Studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are a extremely talented nib technician. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, very cool. Yeah, that's. I'm glad you had good luck, including Visconti. It's nice to hear some of the positive of it because normally we only hear negative, yeah. um, but positive is definitely out there. All right, next one is from Arlene. I totally use the finger slash vacuum slash converter trick. You may end up with converter hickeys on your fingertips though, and I <laughs> never want to see a converter hickey sticker. I don't think we'll do that one. That one would be a little weird. I mean, but... I kind of want to now. <laughs> <laughs> now that you said we shouldn't. But that that was um, the uh, method we talked about last episode where yeah. if you have ink behind the piston seal of your converter, you could uh, reportedly 
put your finger on the business end and then, you know, suction your finger to the converter and, you know, uh, purportedly draw the ink back down past the seal. And we had not tried it. But, uh, I totally forgot about it until just now. Well, there you go. So I'll have to. But we took a week off. It's okay. We did, yeah. It's, it's good. It's good that you didn't think about it. Yeah, it means you were doing. I wasn't good thinking things. about pens very much last week. Good man. We'll get to that later in the pen cast. I had ten people in my house. It was a little crazy. Um, yeah, very cool. Well, I'm glad that you had some luck with that. Um, all right. Key of Chronology says the finger vacuum trick. Oh, here we go again. Here we go. Is also something that I often use if ink gets behind the seal. Gosh, are we like the only ones that didn't I know, know about this right? Thing? Uh, I read about it somewhere online when I was at my wits' end with, funnily enough, my Banu converter. Which was what the original finger trick was in reference to. Well, there you go. I mean, they use a standard international converter. It's not it's just anything special. Yeah. Uh, I've also used it to great success with a Jin Hao converter and a Lamy converter. Well, that's cool. I mean, theoretically, it should work for any converter because it's the same concept that's happening with any of them. If it can get past it, it can get past it again in a better way. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So apparently this is hmm. an effective tool that has been already used. So, uh, hmm. Yeah. Gives me a lot to think about. I yeah, don't know. I'll have to try that. We need to show it on video at some point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, e Journeys says, I literally called out yay when Brian said he bought the sax. I'm also an orchestral size accordion inheritor. <laughs> no way. Or- uh, orchestral size accordion. Is that the, I guess, like the one that I have that's like the piano? And then I thought that was like- just a regular accordion. Uh, I think you can have like the smaller accordion. That's like a concertina. The- I think. They're maybe the concert is that I really don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, big accordion. Um, so E Journey says, My father taught it along with piano and organ. I've played it, though not well. Wishing you all a wonderful and restful Thanksgiving and happy GPC anniversary. One of us had a restful Thanksgiving. I don't know about the other one, considering hmm. had 10 people, but uh, again, more on that later. <laughs> it's like divine rest. Um, and then I assume Turkey Hammock has been pardoned for the holiday. Oh, yes, we party, we pardon. Oh, Turkey yeah. hammock. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then last one, Nordly Selsker says, when I saw the bit about uncapping a pen, I tried it and did it the same way as Brian and thought it was ridiculous to rotate the cap instead. <laughs> right? A few hours later, I caught myself uncapping a pen by rotating the cap with my left oh, hand no. while thinking about something else. So apparently I do something ridiculous when I am not watching. I bet well, you do it too. You don't even know it. How would I ever know? I bet you uncap the cap all the time. Sounds like Nordley was self-aware enough to catch themselves. I, a lot of people responded to this and a lot of people said that <laughs> while they were overthinking it, they're not even sure what they do. <laughs> right, exactly. And it's, it's like when you don't know how to swing your right. arms when you're walking because you think it, overthink it. Yeah, and there were, there were a good amount of it depends comments, Brian. You should be happy okay. to hear that. A lot of folks mentioned, you know, just depending on like if they reach for it and it's in their left hand, then they'll just uncap it with the right. If they reach for it with the right hand, you know, it's, so it changes mm. up depending on kind of like the orientation of how the pen finds itself to be in their hands. Huh. I'll have to observe myself a little bit more to see no, you can't, the different scenarios. No, you can't because then it won't work. You need to be, you need to like I'll set up be a consciously, camera. I'll be consciously yeah. thinking You need to check it. the security footage. It's like the Schrodinger's cat yeah. of, of pen uncapping and capping. Yes. Right? Sure. The fact that you're observing it changes what it is or whatever. That's the thing, right? Mm, yeah. Right? I mean, it's more like if the cat's dead or not, but... It's not... Well, sure. Yeah. It's not <laughs> it's not a perfect metaphor, but you, you get the idea. Yeah. I, have a, I have a quick thing about that. I just thought about, you know, because you have like the capping and uncapping thing. Um, wait, what was I just thinking about? Dead no, cats? Never mind. No, that was... I had some other thought about that. And now I've totally lost track of it. Okay. Never mind. Okay. How about some new stuff? Maybe it'll come back. Okay, let's talk about some new stuff. All right, let's start it off. We have a Pelican M600 fountain pen, Glauco Cambon. This is a special edition. And I won't talk about it too much because it's gonna be featured as a spotlight today. It just looks really freaking cool. Um, and it's about, it's. It's after the artist, Glauco Cambon, who did some cool art that is in, kind of inspired by that style. Um, so it's special edition. I'm not sure how many we're going to get or how long we'll have it. Um, with Pelican special editions, yeah. it's anybody's guess. Uh, but anyway, it's 632. So it's up there a little bit. It's a, it's a brainer. You got to think about this one. I think that it's 
a deal for what it is. I saw it and I expected it to be it, more costly. What I like is that it looks so different than yeah. your normal Pelican special editions that are just different color stripes. I was expecting it to be a thousand. Really? By the way it looks, yeah. Like there's more That's that cool. there's more that goes into this design yeah, yeah. than like a plain old green stripe M800. For sure. So For sure. I don't know. It's pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, we'll show you that more detail. Um, and that is Rachel's favorite nib is the M600, specifically the broad. It's a beautiful pen. It's I a, want it. It's a great nib. All right. Also got a Banu Talisman. This is uh, another one uh, that they've done. The Talisman, they always try to include some little bit of whatever it is because they've had like the four leaf clover one. They've included some clover in there. Um, this one is Hanukkah oil. Uh, so I don't, I would assume there's some oil in there. That one's probably easier than clover or other things that they've tried to put beans. Four leaf clover specifically. Four leaf clover. They yeah. put four leaf clover in them. I'm sure you can buy four leaf clover you can. on the internet. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's like a bag of four leaf clover. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's not what this pen is though. Hanukkah oil. So this one's 175. It's a cool looking pen, but obviously very niche, very specific. This is a limited edition, so they won't be around for too long. Uh, we got the Esterbrook SD fountain pen gift set. So this is kind of cool. So we actually have it in three different colors, Botanical Gardens, Nouveau Blue, and Sea Glass. And it's this cool, like kind of intro starter set, especially if you wanted to gift it to anybody. It's kind of, I think, why they're doing it. It's actually in a box. It's not just like you get all this stuff together. It's actually right. presented very gifty. Yeah, and they did a good job with it. Like the presentation is really nice. Um, so uh, yeah, you get the, the SD pen, you get a single sleeve to store the pen in, uh, a notebook and a pack of cartridges. And it's all presented nicely in this little box. It opens up and it's got some cool instructions and stuff on there. So pretty handy, whether it's a gift for yourself or somebody in your life. You can check that out. And we got the Sailor Pro Gear Soul of Chess limited edition. So if you remember, they had the Knight E4. Uh, what was that last year or was that two years ago? I can't remember. It was, was I remember ago. it was on our, I think it was last year. It was on our list of hottest pens of 2022. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. So I think it's about a year and a half old, something like that. Anyway, so this is sort of a follow up to that one. Um, and apparently, I didn't know this. But the pawn is known as the soul of chess, which is what this pen is after. I had never heard that before until this pen came out. And I was like, oh, I guess I guess it's the soul of chess. It is. Go figure. I would have thought the bishop would be the soul of chess. But I'm... That's the heart. The heart would be the queen, right? I know. I just want to say heart and soul. The king, the knight. It's a great Huey Lewis song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is? Heart and soul. Heart and soul. Okay, yeah. Cool. Uh, anyway, that pen's 460. It's all white. And sort of demo-y a little bit. Right? Yeah, it's got some demo elements. Yeah, but and it's got a little pawn in the finial. That's right. Which is cool because the knight one had the knight in the top. So kind of a cool little element. So you can check that out if you're a chess fan. And that's all I got, Drew. What about you? I've got some more stuff. <laughs> Brian, would you believe it? We're selling washi tape now. You know, never thought I'd see the day, Drew. Today's the day. Actually, last week was the day. But anyway, we are <laughs> selling washi tape in three different designs, uh, three different uh, mm -hmm. exclusive patterns of our stickers. You've got Nub and Fred. You've got the Corgis. You've got the Dragons. And, uh, well, Corgi and Hamster. Uh, but they're available. They're five bucks. So... What is washi tape, Drew? For those washi don't tape know? is very small masking tape that's uh, more or less paper friendly as far as yeah. Tape goes. It's like not as strong as like it's a masking like, tape. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, it's ma masking tape in regards, like it's kind of like painter's tape. It goes on, comes off pretty delicately. Without tearing the paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it can be used to create uh, segments in your journaling, mm -hmm. just patterns, designs, borders, layout, assists in your journal adventures. Also, it's great for kids' crafts. It's a great mm -hmm. way if you want to just give your kids some tape to play with. Kids like tape. And uh, oh, yeah. If you're like me and your kid just goes through rolls of scotch tape and it looks terrible and it leaves sticky crap everywhere, washi is a much more mm. fun and gentle way to let kids kind of go nuts with some tape. I wonder how it would hold up for like posters on the wall. Because that's definitely a thing like, that we're like still trying to figure big out. Big movie posters? Yeah. Just uh, like, or like video game posters, whatever, you know, like posters you put on the wall. I mean, it would be kind of loud because it's not clear at all. Um, yeah, true. And you'd probably need to use a good amount of it, but... Uh, what do you use? What do you... I'm, you I'll frame ask, them. You Okay, I'm not framing my kids' posters. I'm like, well, these are know. just whatever 
posters they pull out of a cereal box or whatever the heck thing that they, they don't do that but you know what i mean like yeah got, whatever I, their, their when interest I was, du jour is when i was that age i used thumbtacks yeah rachel did thumbtacks right into the wall all over her room yeah and she her dad made her like patch them all up yeah they were like if you're gonna do thumbtacks you're gonna help to help fix it i think she was like 15 or something yeah like that. And she, I, I'm not joking. I think she had a hundred posters on her wall with oh, thumbtacks everywhere. My wall was covered, but uh, <laughs> it was just my mom, and my mom was not thinking about drywall damage. So fair enough. If my dad lived with us, then yeah, probably. probably but yeah. Uh, no, yeah. mom didn't care. I just use tape, and then the tape can also peel paint off oh, the wall, yeah. so it doesn't necessarily make it any better. Oh yeah. So you can use know. that. You can use that little putty stuff. Yeah, but that stuff is not the best. It doesn't no. stay up forever, and then it's kind of lumpy. So you like go to stick the poster on, but then it kind of crumples the poster on the corners. I just really haven't found a, a great solution. Yeah. So I don't know. If y'all have any better ones, let me know. Um, in addition to the washi, <clears throat> we're adding another rickshaw product to our lineup. It's a six pen roll. So a different style, not mm -hmm. uh, you know one of their usual zipper pouches, but uh, the six pen roll um, is going to have a design of Mount Etna in Italy which is the mountain uh, volcano, technically, that is used to supply the uh, volcanic uh, ash and magma that is mixed mm -hmm. with resin and turned into the Visconti Homo sapiens, of which is in, the pen case has a Homo sapiens-inspired um, representation there upon it. So it's kind of, it was done by um, the same artist that did the Mount Fuji pen roll that has a pen inspired by the Platinum 3776 on it. So it's kind of a, mm -hmm. uh, in in that same sort lineup. Sort of an homage, yeah. yeah. So a uh, spiritual successor. Um, so those are both now available if you wanted, if you already had the um, Mount Fuji and wanted to add Mount Etna, different styles, but uh, both very cool, both very fun. That is $59. And the Sailor Hokoro pens. Those are interesting, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about them because I did cover that in my What's New video this week. So if you want more information, more detailed information, go check that out. But I will say that we've got the Sailor Hokoro dip pens available now for $16. We've got the dip pen set, which comes with a pen and two nibs for $25. And we've got extra nibs, which are uh, available in fine, medium, 1.0, 2.0, and fude. And those are ten dollars. So, pen, pen set with nibs and nibs themselves. So these are dip pens. However, one interesting things interesting thing about these dip pens is that they have a optional reservoir, which is effectively a feed. Uh, it looks like the feed. It's attached to the bottom of the nib like a feed would be. Sailor calls them the reservoir in this case, and in dip pen terminology, that's you know more you know common. Mm -hmm. So the reservoir uh, will come with all of the 2.0 and Fude nibs, whether you get them separate as just a nib unit or whether you get them attached to a pen, you'll have the feed slash reservoir on them. What that does is just allows you to store more ink in the nib area before running out. Presumably, to dip it less, you know. Yeah, presumably they put that already on the 2.0 and the Fude because those put down the most ink. So they, I guess, they figured they would need them. However, they're not more expensive. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, but all of the other ones are going to have no feed slash reservoir attached to them. So you will need to buy that separately. That is available for four dollars. So there you have that. You cannot fill them with ink in any way. And if you see a four dollar <laughs> reservoir. That's not going to fill your ink with anything. That's not a converter. It is the feed unit. You yeah. know, just speaking in fountain pen terminology that most of us are familiar with because, mm -hmm. you know, as far as what is available at our store, dip pens, not a super common thing. Yeah, when it comes to dip pens and calligraphy stuff, it's like the terminology is sort of close to fountain pens, but sometimes they have similar words that mean very different things. Yeah. So it does get a little confusing, uh, but anyway. Well, yeah. I think Drew is going to plan on no. Buying. I already did. You are you. I already did. By the it time, was great. By the time this is edited and published from now, Drew will have recorded and then published a video showing some that of them have detail. already seen it. So yeah. there you go. So there you go. Those are available now. <laughs> All right, and that's the new stuff. Whew. That's enough. And there's more coming, so be on the lookout. Check out our new arrivals page. Check out coming soon. Uh, this is the time when a lot of things are happening. So uh, that's it for now. Uh, let's get on to the Q&A, shall we? 
All right, before we get on to the Q&A, Brian, we haven't given anybody some free ink recently. We haven't. It's been a while. It has been. And as it is December 1st, um, I'm going to give you some winter celebratory ink. So my favorite it's not holiday. Win it's not winter yet, Drew. Well, not till the twentieth. When they order, like that. you know, it'll it'll get there right on time. Okay. Anyway, my favorite holiday ink is Diamine Winter Spice. It is a brown ink. You do you, like that? I'm sure you've heard this from me before. It's a brown ink with blue shimmer and green sheen, and it does not have too much shimmer, which is one reason I really like this ink. It's not overwhelming, but it's there. However, if you run out of that shimmer, if you've, you know, toward the second half of your ink and you've already used up all your shimmer because you didn't shake it constantly, which is fine, you're still left with that really cool green sheen. Brown and green together. It's festive. It's warm. It's cozy. It's night. It's not like bright, audacious, you know, gold and silver, but it's that nice, cozy, warm winter ink, which is why I mm -hmm. like it. So between December 1st and December 8th, if you place an order with at least one item in your cart at the Goulet Pen Company and you add the promo code SPICE, in all caps, S-P-I-C-E, you can get a sample of Diamine Winter Spice for free. Free gratis. Cool. All right. But I do have a question for you, Brian. I'm ready. Dom Kebas says... Sub Dom. Why do you think the perfect pen for the average user still doesn't exist? I mean, it's a mature industry by now. Why doesn't the perfect pen exist, Brian? I mean, fountain pens have been around for 170 years, 180, something like that. So what are they looking for is my question. Well, we know like, the perfect the... car exists, so why doesn't the... Oh, wait, hold on. And Crap. The... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's like a, is there a perfect article of, like a perfect pair of jeans? Mm, is there a perfect pair of jeans? That's the question. Perfect pair of shoes? I mean, the Pontiac Aztec did come out, so <laughs> we've already achieved perfection, that haven't we? very arguably not the perfect <laughs> car. Um, yeah, I think this is, you know, there's some semantics here, but uh, basically it's, I, I think it already does exist for- And it's the E95 A S. bunch of different, no. a bunch of different- <laughs> For you, yes. No, it's not actually. I don't like the fact you can't clean the uh, the feed. So, not, oh, not the perfect. So it's not head. perfect. No, yeah. no. I would say that perfection is not the goal. I think that that's an un unrealistic thing to achieve, um, especially like perfection for any individual, let alone everyone. The average user, I guess, the average user wouldn't be everyone, but the mean of everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there is a lot of pens that many people would consider to be the perfect pen. Mm -hmm. um, but there's almost always going to be compromise somewhere. So I would say it's, it's at this point, the industry is mature enough where if you don't feel like there's a perfect pen out there, it ain't coming. Like <laughs> there's, there's not like uh, in the, in the life cycle of fountain pens, we're not like trending upwards towards the peak. We're like down in the long tail here um, by probably 70 years or so. So um, I think you're just probably gonna need to compromise a little bit and find the best of what you really like and then be happy with them. Um, you know, I think that there are some perfect pens for some people, other perfect pens for other people. It's gonna be totally different because it's all subjective and it's a personal choice. Um, things like the weight, the size, the nib grind, ink flow, filling mechanism, the price, color, design, and more. There's a lot of factors that make the pen feel perfect. Uh, and I can even say myself, a pen that felt perfect years ago is now no longer the perfect pen for me because my taste change and, you know, I maybe write differently or I just have different needs and different uses for it. So I don't think it's like you should be looking for one perfect pen. I think you should, you know, look for a, a group, an, an, an entourage of pens that meet your various needs and, you know, Pick whichever one suits your purpose. Exactly. And it, like you think of something like like cookware. Like how long has cookware been around? Right. Like to your point, you don't you're not gonna get one pot that's going to be perfect or one pan that's going to be perfect for all situations. Mm, that's a good point. You're gonna have one pan for one application and you're gonna have at least one or two other pans to round out your needs. And, you know, you can talk to the best chefs out there. They don't have one pan that is like, this is all I need. This is the perfect pan. 
Or they probably um, have like a go-to pan. They do. That well, they'll go, they'll but, grab but, more But even than then, others. it's like that same pan in a couple different sizes at least. Right. You know, even the best chefs, they like, hey, you know, if, even if they are kind of a minimalist chefs, they'll still say, all right, you, all you need is these three, you know. Right. Um, it's still more than one. Yeah. And that's because you have different needs. So depending mm -hmm. on what you're writing, how you're writing it, and how often you're using it, you know, I would say that if you wanted to, you know, get 10 pens, uh, you Get what you need. So, mm -hmm. and uh, was it? I watched uh, Last Samurai a couple weeks ago, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ken Watanabe's character in that movie it was trying to describe the perfect cherry blossom. And then at the mm -hmm. very end, he said, They're all perfect. Mm -hmm. So, what mm -hmm. if, if we're trying to figure out perfection? Why don't we mm -hmm. just say that we're just glad the fountain pens are still being made? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the, the one that you're using and the one that makes you happy is the perfect pen. Yeah. Um, another, another, uh, metaphor or not a metaphor another whatever analogy i get them mixed up um is is hammers like oh god the perfect hammer um why do you need 40 hammers you don't you definitely don't but why do you need <laughs> hundreds of pens you don't no but it brings you joy so you you, you get it your so, hammers bring anyway. you joy my hammers do bring me joy yeah did you ever some do you ever just kind of like look at them and just kind of like sure yeah you just look at your hammers i got certain hammers that i look at them i'm like that's a <laughs> nice it's a nice hammer I used a hammer today, just a couple hours ago. Oh, you I know was what? using a hammer. You know what I didn't add? There was so much feedback. You got defended quite passionately about your buckets of rocks. <laughs> Plenty of people are like, Drew, I need my rock bucket. Like, I'm a gardener. I'm in there. What do I yeah. do with the rocks that I dig up? I put them in a bucket. 100%. So I will say you had some rock bucket friends out there. Glad to hear it. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about that, but... I do have. A I'm always going to be honest with you about your feedback. I'm I do not have a number of different buckets as well, but I'm I'm less less particular about my my buckets than than I am about my hammers. <laughs> anyway, to, good, I to, good to know. More particular about my pens, but yes. I like them all. So yeah, I would say Dom. You know, it's a great question. I, I get the sentiment. Mm -hmm. Not trying to pick on you here, but I think it is an unsolvable you know, thing that you're going for, trying and, to get one perfect thing for a group of people. Ain't and you happen. do find that across many product lines. Oh, you any, know, it, any hobby, any interest, yeah. Or even even, even uh, essentials, like, you yeah. know, a, like a printer or, you know. A, oh, geez, yeah. Yeah, like they, cars. Yeah. Television. Literally anything, yeah. yeah. A office chair. Yeah, a chair. A sofa. Yeah. Socks. I've been, I've been, all over the internet looking for a good sofa because I'm so sick of buying sofas that have crappy uh, foam mattresses. So I'm like mm. looking into like spring steel and stuff like that. And even then you're still like, no one knows what the perfect sofa is. How mm. long we've we been sitting Yeah. as a, as a species. You know, we still haven't figured out the chair or know. the couch. I know, it's crazy. So, yeah. Whatever, we're complex. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Uh. All right, <clears throat> Drew, you ready for this? Yes. All right, this is from Jobby. Says, hey y'all. When I bought my first Lamy Studio, one of the representatives told me that as you use, I don't know who this representative is. Probably I Phil. I don't think it was our team. Um, <laughs> who's Phil? I don't know. Um, that as you use the pen, the nib broadens. So it turns from a fine to a medium or a medium to a broad. Mm -hmm. I tested some fine 14K nibs in the store and they looked weirdly thick. So could it have been the treatment they get after a lot of testing or something else, I ended up buying a fine, but have not noticed any difference after a year. Is this a fact or a myth? Thanks, been loving all of the content from TikTok, Instagram, and the podcasts. Well, in fact, going back to our previous question, Big Fountain Pen wants you to have to keep buying new nibs. So they mm. actually are now producing nibs that melt over uh, under friction and use, mm. so they get wider as the uh, alloy actually um, turns to liquid. So um, that's a good plan. That's probably what's happening. No, yeah. uh, that's one hundred percent a myth, uh, Javi. Water, water, um, water soluble nibs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's one hundred percent a myth. And yes, if you're using a, if you went to the like the Lamy store, you know, per chance, and you know, bought these from somebody that has been allowing people to test them over and over again, you know, multiple times, perhaps hundreds of times a day. Uh, somebody's going to come along or just the amount of people are going to make 
those nibs open up a little bit yeah, by pressing down it. too hard. Yep. Yes, indeed. For sure. So that's almost definitely what you were experiencing in the store. And just by nature, the fact that you got one, took it home, and it was not like that kind of proves that point. And it's not hard to do. It's I will say, Lamy nibs require quite a bit of pressure to spring those because they're pretty rigid nibs and they are. quite the, stiff. The 14K a little less so, if, they're, it's, if that's what they're talking about. The studio? They said they tested some 14K Oh, nibs. yeah, that's true. The studio has some that are steel yeah. and some that are gold. So those, those can bend a little I bit. I can see the gold ones yeah. bending easier. And while you know? while the gold nib, the gold Lamy nibs are pretty darn wet, you, know, you will notice the difference between those versus their steel nibs in terms of line width, um, just because they put down ink a little bit more uh, um, liberally. But... You, nibs do not, and a representative should not be telling you that nibs just all broaden over time. If you're using them properly, that will not happen. If yeah. you have a heavy hand, then yes, that very well could happen. Yeah. Um, in rare circumstances, if you are using your pen a lot every day for years, your tipping material could flatten out a little bit so that um, your line could widen marginally, yeah. like imperceptibly. And it takes a lot of writing to do that. These alloys are very, very hard that they use for tipping material. Yeah, that's a good um, point. But yeah. it could happen, but I'm, it's pro like, I would bet that there's, as far as a tester pen goes, there's something else on that pen that's going to fail and cause it to be thrown away or discarded before that writing pad gets so worn down. No, like, you're talking like years. The likelihood of, of that, of any pen surviving a testing scenario for that long and the writing pad getting worn down no, is being that's like not, that, that's, that's not fun. <laughs> no. No, I think somebody, you know, especially if it's different people yeah. coming into a store, they may or may not have any experience with fountain pens. I mean, we don't have a public facing storefront, so we don't actually deal with this as much on a regular basis, but we know from interacting with customers virtually and then going to pen shows and just interacting with a lot of different pen people um, and giving fountain pens to other people in oh, our yeah. life. I know the. I always have to caveat any pen I hand to somebody. You don't need to push. You don't need to push. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like the cap on screws first because everybody wants to yank the cap and they're going to strip the threads um, or they're going to just mash that nib down. Oh, yeah. Or if it doesn't write right away, they're going to like tap it on the paper or something like that if they even have the nib, you know, the right orientation. Yeah, sometimes the feed's pointing up. Yeah, so if it's just the general public going in and using tester pens, I can imagine those things are gonna be all kinds of messed up over time. Absolutely. You know, so I definitely wouldn't necessarily trust like the pen that's been the tester, but. No, um, and this is not like super far off from the myth that your fountain pen will adapt itself to whoever the user is. Um, you know, fountain yeah. pens just, if you're if you're writing properly with them without pushing down unnecessarily at a good angle, you know, using restraint, uh, it doesn't matter who's holding it as long as they're holding it the right way. It should it'll write and not for pressing too hard. Yeah, I, I would say half of my fountain pens are pre-owned. You know that I've got via trades mm -hmm. or secondhand purchases, and I've had that problem with none of them. Yeah. So, yeah. I can also say if it's an issue with your. Tines are sprung and it writes too wide. Or if you have written with it so much that it wears down, kind of like Drew was talking about, those are both both fixable things. Like a nib professional can fix both of those issues too. So even if that does happen and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, it depends on the pen, you know, if it's gonna be worth it to fix that for you. But if it's, you know, if it's a 14 karat studio, those can run you a couple hundred bucks maybe. You know, it might be worth it to spend 35 bucks or something like that to get a nib meister to tune it up and get it working well. Yeah, but in this case, time. I think Javi, you're probably uh, just a, you're, you're the right person to own your yeah. Lamy Studio 14K nib and the yeah. ones you're that fine. you used uh, were not so now, cared for. One thing I will say, so I have my Pilot Custom 74 with the medium nib, the blue one mm -hmm. that I was like one of my first, uh, it was my first gold nib pen. Um, I use that pen pretty exclusively for quite some time. And while I didn't wear down the writing pad, uh, I will say that I previously tended towards broad nibs and stubs. So with that nib in particular, I wrote with a very heavy hand because I was trying to get, I was less experienced and I was trying to get a heavier flow than the pen naturally wanted to put out. So I think I did 
widen that nib just a little bit, ever so slightly, because when I have used other newer ones, I'm like, oh yeah, okay, this writes just a little bit finer than my medium, because I was, you know, essentially writing with a really heavy hand for a number of years. Um, that is maybe more of a case like for kind of what the, the person oh, yeah. was saying. And but, I've done that on purpose before. Like sometimes oh, I've- You can definitely do it on purpose. I've yeah. sometimes I've purposefully, because a pen had terrible flow, I've purposefully like sacrificed what's mm -hmm. what it in what its intended line width was yeah. just so i could have decent flow yeah. um, and sometimes it works sometimes you screwed up and you just regret your life but um yeah. <laughs> yeah but i would not say like this is a hard and fast rule that this no. will happen it can but you know like anything else it depends and there's nuance but i would not say that like oh this happens over time like no it it, it, it shouldn't happen it can it, yeah but it should really shouldn't no okay <laughs> cool <laughs> all right all right, um, our friend Tatiana Hall has a question for us, and she specifically is asking if we can hear Brian's version of the pen draft, which Adrian and I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is from episode 110, mm -hmm. which was, you know, a few weeks ago at this point. Uh, I was out of town and, uh, you know, did not have to answer that question. Uh, but I got pinned you down not anyway. did have the opportunity. <laughs> yes, that's the more positive way to say it. Because you know me, I love making choices and narrowing down my favorites. Though I will say, version of the pen draft, it was kind of like open-ended. I didn't like have any specific like, I need one pen to fill this purpose, another one to fill that purpose. Great. And I watched back, you know, with you and Adrian. And yeah. you didn't like choose specific roles or anything like that. So I was like, oh, okay. So this is more just like a general kind of top five. Yeah. Not necessarily and you should be like, thankful because someone asked a question your house is on fire, which one pen are you grabbing before you leave? So I did not even bother ask, telling you that. So you're welcome. Well, thankfully, I have a lot of my pens stored at the office. I've that, you, so oh I would God, be there we great go. There's the Brian caveat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. oh my gosh. Um, uh. Yep. Okay, so going back to that episode, I figured I would recap your and Adrian's choices because I didn't want to duplicate. See, so I specifically didn't put it on the document because I didn't want you to care. I wanted well, you to just do your own thing. I had to go back and watch because okay. I needed to get context as to like how you all answered it. Anyway, Fair enough. Um, so Adrian, but either even still, as we go through the list, I, I didn't have a lot of overlap. Oh, cool. So it actually kind of worked out. So Adrian chose the Banu Euphoria Sangria which is an exclusive of ours. Um, the Opus 88 demo, the Pilot Custom 912. No, I wrote Custom 812. That's not a thing. No. No, she didn't choose a 912. You chose a 912. Mm -hmm. What did she choose? Pilot Custom, was it 823? She probably picked an 823. I wrote 812. I don't know what I was thinking. I was trying to do too much at one time. Custom 823. Um, the Quaco Irid Sport Iridescent Pearl. The uh, Twisby 580 ALR. Prussian blue. Pretty solid list, I gotta say. Uh, you chose the Pilot E95S, shocker. Pilot Custom 912, also shocker. With the Falcon nib, right? Wasn't that yeah. the one you chose? Yeah. Uh, Sailor Pro Gear Slim Moroccan Mint Tea. Mm. The Kawiko Lilliput Green. Mm -hmm. And the Shone Pocket 6 Dark Matter. Oh, those are some good picks. Yes. Some good picks. Have you gotten one of those yet? No. Because you said that you needed to before they ran out. I'm pretty sure they're sold out. I think they are. Yep. Well, well. okay. Um, so I'm realizing now that I did actually pick one duplicate, but that's fine. Um, so I'm going to start with my lower end picks. I went surprisingly low end. Did you get up I close to a thousand? A little bit. No, not really. Okay. I kind of So the rules were uh, you can pick five pens but you cannot go over a thousand dollars for the, you know, in this yes. case, the drafts salary cap. Yep, that was the rule. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna revise. Uh oh. Because I, I I realize I did choose one of Adrian's, so I'm gonna. That's I'm gonna okay. Cancel it out. No, 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 no. Uh. Because I had. Okay, so original. Well, I'll just I'll share everything because it's all just for entertainment. None of this matters. Um, <laughs> so my original, my original pick, not realizing I actually duplicated one of Adrian's. Um, I chose the Pilot Varsity as one of my pens. Okay. Technically the seven pack. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Because I wanted the different colors and, and it's disposable. Yeah, so I why figured not? that was, you know, that was acceptable within these rules, I mm -hmm. guess, um, which is like 25 bucks. Uh, Twisby Eco Transparent Blue with a broad nib. 
I like the Eco. Such a solid pen. Okay. The Varsity I did because it's like, it's a great disposable Why pen. not throw it in there? It can last you apparently 40 years uncapped and okay. still write. Yeah. <laughs> so I like the reliability of that. Um, and it's a great pen to give away to other people. Uh, mm -hmm. The Transparent Blue, I really like that. It's a great pen. I was going to choose the 580 ALR Prussian Blue, mm -hmm. but Adrian chose that and I was like, okay. I like the Eco as much. So I went with that one. <clears throat> I went with the Traveler's Company brass pen uh -huh. as my pocket pen, which I will say recently I have uh, been carrying it around again. Well, you're going to assemble a carport, Brian. I could. Oh. It's not going to hold me back. Ready to go. Yeah, I got it in there right next to my pocket knife and I have used it. I've used it when I needed to go to like the doctor's office and they hand me a clipboard and they want me to fill out some forms with some crappy ballpoint. And I'm like, no, no, no. Get that out of here. You can keep that pen. I whip that thing out and I'm like, Pow. I'm like, I'm gonna fill it out in red. There you go, because I can. Um, yes, so that that is $69. And then I chose- You the, haven't even crossed the 200 point yet, Brian. Not yet. Well, I'm going up in price. Okay. Um, I have the Lamy 2000, shocker. Uh -huh. I'm surprised neither of you picked the Lamy 2000, to be honest with you. So I would pick that one, because I use that. I always have a Lamy 2000 in my rotation, and I have for, probably a decade now. Yes. Um, the fine nib and that one, the black Lamy 2000, not the stainless. That pen is 223. And then the last pen I had was the Pilot Custom 823, which I realize now that Adrian had on there. So I do like that choice. I would stand by it, but I think I'm gonna take that one out because I don't wanna duplicate. So my version 2.0 here, I would take that out, downgrade my Pilot Varsity 7 pack to a single Varsity. Okay. Because that keeps me under the threshold for the $1,000. Can you put an 845 in there? No. No, okay. No, that thing's like 900 bucks. No. 845? No, yeah, the custom 845 is up there because it's Yurushi. Yeah, well, how much is the Yurushi then? The that's... custom Yurushi is 16, 15, Oh, 1600. God, all yeah. right, all right, all right. No, that's way over. Okay. Yeah, oh, I would love to get that, but no. Yeah, no, yeah, okay. No, we're way over. Okay. Uh, no, the last one I would do is the uh, Magna Carta Mag 600. Oh. With that flex name? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, why? I'm digging that. So I need to do the math. I think when I did it, when I had the pars the Varsity 7 pack in there and I took out the 823, I think it had me at like $1,011 or something like that. So I think if I downgrade my Varsity to the single instead of the 7 pack, I think that puts me, because that, that pen is 350. Um, Brian, there's, so the- sing No, wait, if I could take out the custom 823. No, no, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be in, The in single shape Varsity there. is the only the pilot in no, your list. I can keep my, I can keep my 7 pack. I can keep my seven pack, yeah. Interesting. Let me do that math real quick. I mean, I love pilots, but you already took the there's, 912 there's and no the E95S. You're making, and Adrian already took who's the Who's making up arbitrary rules now? I found it helpful to have some <laughs> some boundaries. Well, just know I would be just as happy with an E23. Yeah. That pen is super cool. Um, and uh, the the uh, uh, mm -hmm. 580 ALR Prussian Blue. Oh, yeah. I like that one too. It was funny. Love Adrian the, mentioned that that was her favorite. I'm like, man, girl, you sold me that pen. Like, you traded I me know. for a. She mentioned a couple of pens that she, she yeah. traded away. She traded me that for a Monte Grappa Elmo. I'm like, all right. All right. Well, that's fine. I got a. Elmo's not on her list, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So actually, the custom A23 is not that far off from. Let me redo the math real quick. So if it's 2584. Well, um, while can, Brian is doing math. I'd like to just tell everybody that I'm riding with my Cozy Penguins Retro 51 Rollerball, which is available now at GoodlyPens.com. It is our exclusive holiday sweater design. So if you have any of the other holiday pens, you are obligated to purchase this one or else everybody will know that you hate pens. There you go. That's all. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. All right, um, $701 is what my total comes up to. All right. Plus a couple cents. And you sure you don't want to get rid of that $25 varsity pack and actually get a decent pen that's like $200? I'm good. Oh my God. I want right. a variety. I want a variety. You need something to fill the bench. <laughs> okay. You know? you know you can put different color inks in some of these nice pens to get your variety there. I'm digging the varsity recently. Uh, so know. am I. So am I. To be perfectly fair. I will. This, talk. List, this list will change. In a week. That's very true. So don't, mine, don't hold me to this. Mine too. Mine too. <laughs> All cool. right. Brian. Um, oh, this is my question for you. Wait, what? Oh, right. oh we're, I, was, I was about to yep. skip one. All right. Yeah, nope. yeah. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. All right. Matthias says, Drew, do you have any exceptions from your three pin rule? 
talking about arbitrary rules. No. Yes, I do. Of course I do. Um, here's the thing. The reason why I need to have exceptions for my three pen rule, which if you do not know, I only ever keep three pens inked up at any given time. Uh, at present, uh, I haven't changed it actually. I've got a Gravitas Sentry, a, uh, you know, my Pro Gear Slim in uh, Manyo Nuts, and then a uh, Diplomat Arrow. Um, so these have been, you know, uh, I haven't been writing as frequently because I've been taking some time off and uh, um, I don't, uh, write at home as much as I do at work. But speaking of home and work, the reason I need to have, I need to break my arbitrary rule is because if I leave this thing in my bag at work, I'm at home with no fountain pens. And I do, while I don't write as much at home with fountain pens, mm -hmm. if I write with something, I'm going to use a fountain pen because why? So I need to have fountain pens at home. And the fountain pens I have at home are Pilot Varsities. So I was in, literally going to say, just keep the varsity. Absolutely, I do. In, 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 in the drawers of my home where writing utensils are, there's a bunch of crap that Archer threw in there and Pilot Varsities. So I can yeah. always get a varsity if I need to. I can always write with a fountain pen, even if I'm foolish enough to leave my nice fountain pens at work. Vice versa, if I leave my bag at home, I'm at my office, I'm at my desk, I'm working at a fountain pen store, and I don't have any inked up fountain pens in my desk, like, I would just... Brian would, he's got a button in his office and he would hit a button and my chair would fall into a pit of alligators. Like it can't happen. I need to make sure that I'm utilizing fountain pens. Yep. Um, so uh, I keep a desk pen inked up. Usually right now it's actually not inked up. I recently cleaned it. I need to re-ink it up. Um, and I usually do have pens that I'm testing mm. um, or playing around with or- yeah writing for some work purpose on my desk as well. So that's not really your pens that you're inking up. That's no, like... but, but so that's not really a, a breaking of the rule, but having my desk pen inked up, it's a 3d printed pen that I bought. I DM'd through purchasing some person on Instagram. So, um, but that's just my, I don't know. I didn't select it to be my desk pen. It just kind of <laughs> just kind of happened, happened, but I also have a 3D printed little Death Star pen stand from Evan at uh, Penquisition. So I'm like 3D printed pen, 3D printed pen stand. Great, that's just gonna be a thing. So my little 3D printed pen is my desk pen that's usually inked up uh, with a private reserve cartridge. Um, I have had a pack of Naples Blue that I completely ran out. So I use up all of those cartridges. Wow. And uh, I think I am on uh, Spearmint or Avocado now. So. That's a cartridge only pen anyway. So yes, I break my okay. rules. I was by like, keeping... why are you using cartridges? <laughs> yeah, it's a cartridge only pen. It's a very small pen. Okay. I break my rule at home by keeping varsities and I break my rule at the office by keeping a desk pen just in case mm. I leave my stuff somewhere, which I do quite often. I left my pens at, at the office last night. Should have brought home my bag. So I didn't mm. have any pens and I didn't have the, uh, the sheet music that Shannon asked me to print out using the Gulli Pen Company's laser <gasps> toner. So how dare you? I know that's straight sense. Straight up, sense straight up, toner. straight up stole that. You, oh. um, so uh, yeah, she was like, "Hey, did you print that thing for me?" I was like, "Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I did, and it's at work." <laughs> <laughs> I'm great. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and sometimes Archer might have one of his pens inked up at home, and I'll use that if I need to. But yeah, uh, that's his pen. That's different. Uh, that's fine. He doesn't use them anyway. <laughs> He's terrible. He's yeah. like, "Oh yeah, I have these." I'm like, "Yeah, I know." Yeah. But yeah. I break my rule. Cool. And I break your rule all the time. Great. Um, question number five to, comes to us this week from okay. Quinn's <clears throat> Curios. Mm -hmm. Quinn asks, do larger nibs have more tipping than their smaller ones? Would a nibmeister have more to work with? Yeah. See, yeah. I did the Brian thing here and I completely misread this did you um because What'd you read it as i thought that quinn was talking about a physically larger nib oh. like would that have more tipping on it than a physically i guess smaller you could read nib? it that way i didn't right. read it that way i, I, but, I interpreted larger well because you because you read the whole question when quinn says would a nibmeister have more to work with and i did the thing you normally do not read the whole question and just immediately, immediately jump right into it i mean a larger physical overall nib does also give the nibmeister more to work with. I guess technically- Especially I'm thinking like a Mark Bacchus type who like removes the nib off the pen and then handles just right. the nib. That's not what I was thinking of. I thought okay. that I was thinking purely like, oh yeah, there, is there more tipping on like a, you know, Mag 1000 nib than, you know, a Lamy okay, well, broad tell nib. you what, you'll get a two for one. Oh no, no, I don't we'll, have an answer. We'll cover That's all, just what I thought. No, I have the answer. Yeah, go for, go for I'll it. I'll cover both. Oh, 
All right. Um, so if you interpreted the question as Drew did. Don't. It's wrong. AKA incorrectly. Yes. Um, I do not believe that as a rule, the larger the physical nib is, the more tipping that there is. It probably depends on manufacturer, but I don't think so because it all that matters when it comes to the tip size is the tip. It yeah. doesn't really matter what it's on. Um, though there's different manufacturers. I'll say that you can probably find like correlation, but not causation with that. I mean, there are probably some manufacturers that make larger nibs that might have more tipping, but the part that actually touches the paper is the same you know, size, but maybe it's more oblong or, you know, there's more like up on top or something like that, where yes, theoretically, maybe um, it could work. But I think as a general rule, um, it's really just all about what the intended end result tip size is going to be. That's what, that's how much like tipping is being welded onto that nib. Um, it doesn't really matter necessarily what, what type of nib it's being put onto. Does that make sense? Uh, kinda. So you're so, saying, that, but are you saying that a different tip gets welded onto different nibs based on what it's going to be? Yes. Really? Yep. It's not the same. Like I've seen, I've seen the bowl of tipping material. It's all, they're all the same little balls. Well, they, they are for each nib size. Yeah. But, you know, for example, like when I went to Lamy, they use different tip, like little ball mm -hmm. tips for the different nib sizes. So a broad is going to get more tipping material welded onto it than a fine or an extra Interesting. fine. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know if it's like absolutely every manufacturer does it that way. Yeah, because I feel but like- I when... believe that's how it is because the tipping material is very expensive. These are all precious yeah. metals. So you basically don't want to weld on any more tipping material than you have to. And mm -hmm. if you think about like a broad or a stub or double broad or something, it takes a lot of tipping material to do that. If you did that for every nib- you're going to be you're wasting have, a lot. You're going to be wasting material, and that's a lot more to have to grind away yeah. to okay. get to a fine or extra fine or even finer. Yeah. So basically, the the more you know closer to the end finished size, that makes sense. When you weld the tip on, it saves you money, it saves you time and hand work and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I feel like so the, the, that's why when, they do it that when way. When I have seen factory images and visits, I just remember only seeing one little reservoir of you know, alloy yeah. balls and that's because they're going to, they're going to manufacture one, yeah. nib, one nib size. So I was always kind of visualizing that. And I've never like, I've never seen them all kind of like lined up like, Oh, here's our extra fine balls. Here's our medium. You know, no, that's how it is though. Yeah. Right. So, like, that makes way more sense. Yeah. And I've seen, you know, and there's basically like one supplier that makes these tipping. Things. I've heard that. It's Cause it's an incredibly specialized thing. Well, that's my fallback so, plan. If you fire me, I'm going to go, you're just going to go, you know, tipping material balls be like, okay. yeah, guess who else is in the game now, buddy. There you go. Me. Okay. Where do I get this stuff? Does anybody yeah. got a meteor? <laughs> I mean, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Fallback. So very so, reliable yeah. fallback. Um, so the answer is it does not depend on the nib, the overall nib size necessarily. Uh, but yeah. So, you know, to, to go with the second part of your question, uh, would a nibmeister have more to work with with a broader size nib? Yes, of course, they absolutely yeah. would. Um, depends what they're trying to do. Now, I will say, like, if you're trying to get, you know, a a fine italic or something like that, a nibmeister can grind that down from a broad or a, a much bigger stub or something like that. But again, that's just more they're gonna have to grind away. So they can do that, but it's more preferable if you want to get a fine italic to start with a fine nib and then make it an italic, and then you have a fine italic. You don't want to start with a 1.5 stub and then have to grind that down to a fine italic. It can be done, but it's just a lot, it's more work. So yeah, a nibmeister can, mm, when it comes to making things smaller, very easy to do. Making things bigger, if you have a fine nib and you're trying to go to a 1.5 stub, that is technically possible, but fewer nibmeisters are gonna be able to do that because that requires you to basically weld more tipping material on, which is not something that is very easy to do. Though there are some people that do it, no. and um, some some uh, not all you know broad nibs are created equal either. You know you could take mm -hmm. a broad Visconti and a broad Lamy and say, hey, you know you you made me a you know a uh, you know point seven stub with this. Can you also make me a point seven stub with that? And well, no, that's a bad example. You did an architect for me or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, the nib technicians very likely going to say, well, it won't be exactly the same because you know, height plays a role too, mm -hmm. you know, because you're completely changing the shape and not just the, it's not all about the amount of tipping material that a brand might affix to their nib. It's about the shape that they put them out with. Mm -hmm. I know that I've spoken with Mark Bacchus before and Visconti, you know, their end result 
um, of the size that they get uh, is consistent, but the way they shape their nibs in order to get that, mm -hmm. you know, has changed over the years. Mm -hmm. So what he used to do, he can no longer do, not because the width, you know, like you said, the end result has changed, right. but just the shaping methods have changed. So, yeah. you know, his options get limited. Yeah. And this is getting, this gets like super specialized. So basically if you want to get any kind of specialty work done, you got to talk to a nib meister. And, you know, if you're, if you're basically saying, I want to get my nib ground to a, say it's an architect or something like that, that requires, you know, a pretty good amount of tipping material to start with basically reach out to them and say, what nib size do I need to buy in order to make it that? And they'll be able to guide you there. And if you tell them like, for example, if you're like, oh, I have a Visconti or I have a whatever, a Twisby or I have a whatever it is you're trying to do, they'll be able to say like, okay, you should get this size if the end result you're trying to get is, you know, a certain italic size or a certain architect or some other specialty type thing. So um, yeah, there you go. But that's that's basically it. Yep, go the bigger, bigger the nib size, the more options you have when it comes to custom grinds. All right, that's what we have for Q&A this week. So if you want to leave us some comments on YouTube or shoot us an email at pencast at .com, we will continue to take questions. All right, and we got a pen spotlight. This is gonna be on the M600 Glauco Cambon and uh, you'll have to check this thing out. It looks really cool. Pelican M600 Glauco Cambon. Tell me more. I will tell you more. Of course, I put away my notes now. It's got a white box. It's got a white box. So it is, uh, it's got nice, it's got a little finger cutout that you can uh, grab. Yeah, so um, this is an artist, Glauco Cambon, uh, a painter. So he was a painter that did, uh, what is it? Portrait of Attilo Hortus and music. Um, so that was some of the ones that initially got him to fame. There you go. So a little different box than normal because it is a special edition. Uh, part of their art collection. So they've done other art collection pens before, I believe, that are different than their just normal stripe. So it's got a little magnetic kind of flap. You open it up and there you go. So you're seeing some of his artwork right there with some pelicans, kind of neat. I have not unboxed this yet before, so we're going on the journey together. Oh, there we go. Flips right up and here's the pen. Kind of tucked in here. What else is in here? Do we got any other goodies? No. Looks like we might have a book in there. A little card. I'm trying to think if there's something in here. I don't know. Let's find out. I think it's just a placeholder. Oh, there's cardboard in there. <laughs> cool. That's kind of nice though. It's not just like an empty box that the thing could flop around. There is a book in here. Let's check out the book and then we'll check out the pen. Da -da -da. So here you go. You can learn some more about the artist. Ooh, cool. You got a little German, a little English. Cool, you get to see a little bit of the history of the artists. There you go. Whoa! That is a That's mustache. A strong mustache. I dig it. Nobody wears glasses like that anymore. I don't know, it's a lost look. Kind of cool. Okay, um, yeah, anyway, you get to see all kinds of artwork. Pretty cool. That's the inspiration for this pen. I really don't know art, so I'm not even gonna try to explain it all, but. Um, I believe he was a poster artist. Okay, there you go, poster artist. Let's pull this thing out of here. It's kind of tucked away. It doesn't look as impressive in the plastic, so I'm gonna get this thing out of there. Boom, now that looks cool. Oh man, that is wild. So it's still got some little stripiness in there, but it's not your normal pelican stripes. And it's got the like splashes of color, like you would see from his artwork. This is, that is rad the coolest looking. pelican I have seen perhaps ever. Ever? I love this you pen think so? so much. It is, well, to me, it's as exciting as a pelican should get. Like that red rodden from last year, that was just so, that was a bit much. It was a bit ostentatious yeah, for me. Well, that one and was, I also yeah. don't think it was like definitively pelican. This to me, is exciting, vibrant, and fun, but yet still very pelican. I feel like it's and just- It's like in the dark, you can hardly see the color at all. And then when the light hits it, it's like, bow! Yeah. Right in your face. I think it's it's retaining- Very cool. Like the pelican elegance, while yeah. still being very exciting and vibrant. That. It just like shimmers. Not really shimmers. It's like, I don't even know how to describe it. But yeah, you can see it's almost like a, 
Like a holograph type is it, material. It looks like it's textured beneath the yeah, color. Yeah, it's totally smooth on top. But yeah, like the color stuff itself is kind of textured. You know how you had like those holographic cards that yeah. you like sort of look? It almost looks like that, except it doesn't, doesn't have like an image or anything in there. But it's got some of that effect. And it's orange and green. Orange and green, and there's red in here. There's uh, a little bit of blue too. There's All a lot, kind of, of, woven there's a lot of colors. Orange is... Orange Black. is probably the most prominent on this one. Um, but like, yeah, the way you're tilting it, I'm seeing some teals and blues here on yeah, this end. Yeah, so like up here, there's a little bit of green. There's a little more blue right here. There's some blue kind of down here. So yeah, it's a nice nice it mix. Absolutely gorgeous. Splashes of colors. Really cool. The M6, yeah, the M600 has got a really good weight to it. I mean, I've got a really big hand and like the M400 to me, it just feels way too light. It's not that much smaller, but the M600 has got a little more weight to it. Then the 800 and the 1,000 get even bigger. Um, but this one is a good all-around size. Like Rachel loves this size. This is probably like the smallest Pelican that I really like to use. Um, but it's a really good one. And then the nib is beautiful too. I love the Pelican nibs. So it's got a two-tone with the bird on it. Looks really classy with all the swirly, you know, ornamentation there. Nice. 14-karat nib. This one's an extra fine, which... I would pass on that, but you know, for me, <laughs> I mean, for me, like, medium or broad is the way to go on this. Yeah, with a pelican, it almost like feels yeah. broad. Wrong. Like, yeah, I mean, no, a lot of people. I mean, the pelican nibs are really wet as it is, so yeah. even an extra fine ain't no pilot or sailor. Yeah, extra fine. I can tell you that That's much. That's true. It's still gonna be very, very wet, but you know. But they do medium to broad. Their broader so nibs well. are just like mm, it's like butter. So yeah, there you go. Very cool. Just we don't to... we don't have many of these. Um, I think we're going to be the able to get more, works. but Pow. I'm not certain. But honestly, dude, for for you know less than seven hundred dollars, uh, I think this is that has this has a whole lot going for it. Because again, this looks really cool with the M800, M1000. Like they're more expensive than this, and they have less going on. They're they're larger, but that's it. Yeah, that's a nice size. This is a, it's a balanced size. It doesn't. I think it's fantastic. Doesn't stick out like crazy. It's absolutely there gorgeous. You go. There you go. There's a pen. I really honestly just wanted to show it off to you. Fantastic. I thought it looked cool. Now that we have gotten through the, I don't know, helpful portion, we can talk about our nonsense with what's happening. All right. Drew, what's I have, happening? I have, I have a question for you. I got an answer. And I know that pretty much the only time my wife watches any sort of pen cast is she skips to the what's happening sections to make sure I don't talk trash about her. <laughs> I'm going to talk trash about her. Uh-oh. This lady, when she opens cereal bags, Brian, she opens them with the destructive fervor of just a, a, a ravenous beast. Mm. And she splits the cereal bag down the side so when you pour it out, like it has to, it tumbles down the cardboard into your bowl and then you flip it back over and then anything that doesn't go back into the bag because of this giant split, right? you know, just goes into the bottom of the box. You think it's a split like on the, the flat side of the bag? She opens the- like on the end? Oh, it's on it's on the flat, it's on the side. Does she open it like a bag of potato chips? Yes, but, like it, but, it, but it tears. No, no, she happens it on the side, but it tears down the side. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what so, you mean. And that's okay. And I get sometimes that happens accidentally mm. with Shannon, like half of our cereal boxes, are, I'd be at bed, the bags inside the boxes are mm. like that. And I just, I don't know, I wanna know like, is this a normal thing? Do other people go through this? Do you have a I, spouse that is- I experienced this. With you or with no. Rachel? With the kids? Oh no. I know what the heck I'm doing when it comes right. to cereal. Thank you. I've eaten so much cereal in my life. <laughs> Yes. I, I care about this more than most. You 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 need to use force, but it's a controlled force. Yeah. So that when it opens up, it doesn't go. Ah, you know, it's like it's it's like when you're taking the nib and the feed out of your. Yes, pen. exactly. You don't just like use your whole arm and just ah, right. abandon. You gotta like brace your hands against you kinda, each you kinda, other. Yeah, and you control you pry it. Yeah. 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 You gotta gently pry it open. Okay. So who you in your just, household does this? I'm pretty much the only one that I think does it Wait, the way you, that it should be done. You, oh, no, 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 but everybody else tears it? <sighs> the, the ratio, I mean, not on purpose, but yeah, right. tearing happens all the time. Yeah. I tape the bag back. Well, I, with this, oh, you do? You tape it? I tape it. Okay. I so, can't deal with the, I can't deal with the cereal all right, thank going you. back so, into the box. So you, you get it. It drives me crazy. You get it. All right. Thank yeah. you. Because this morning, 
I went because uh, I asked Archer which which cereal he wanted. Oh he he picked one that Shannon had just opened. Yeah. And I op I open it and I just look down, and I'm quiet. <laughs> I don't just say look, anything. Just mangled. I don't say anything. I'm not looking at Shannon. She sees me looking, and she just starts laughing <laughs> because she knows what I'm looking at. She knows the distress in my soul. She clearly she doesn't. She doesn't feel bad about no, it. No, not at all. Okay. She thinks it's hilarious. She's like, I I tried. I'm like, no, you didn't. Hmm. But it's it's hilarious. I haven't ever tried to tape it up. But uh, what I did this time, oh, I'm like, I'm, it up. I'm not pouring it down this side. So I opened up the whole top of the bag, poured oh. it out of the other side, and then rolled it up and put a chip clip on it. Oh, wow. um, so the taping, you know, maybe 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 I'll tape it next time. I do have yeah. some packing tape at home. It's, yeah, that's what I'll do. Oh, uh, you'll I, use packing tape. I will you? use packing tape. Hundred <laughs> percent. That's amazing. Same thing. Same thing happens when I like um, like coffee bags are the worst. Coffee bags are bad. Like coffee bags, you'll they'll like have like holes in yes. the middle that will stay stuck where terrible. it's glued. Those are bad. Those Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin Donuts brand is terrible too. Yeah. We, we bought Dunkin' Donuts coffee before and they always tear. They're yeah. garbage. Those, those I don't blame her as much for because I'm like, I know those are janky. Yeah, those are tough. Those are tough. But cereal, like, come on. It's one of those things that like, I've just accepted that I'm more particular about it than anybody else in my house. Yes. So I just kind of deal with it and then I will tape the bags and just make it. <laughs> I, deal, it I deal with it, but not uh, silently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's fair um but uh yeah let's see um apart from that which i just needed to get off my chest <laughs> um i was playing uh, i took the week off so um yeah i got to be lazy again and um i played a spider-man video game like for the entire week almost okay. um all right and I loved it. I'm not like I'm not a huge Spider-Man fan. I like I like Spider-Man as much as the next guy, I guess. But sure. the game is really, really fun. You, you're hmm. swinging around, being Spider-Man. The uh, the New York is very well laid out, um, convincingly. Like okay. I, I was able to find the Ghostbusters fires ha firehouse. Like oh, there it is, because that's an actual <laughs> building in New York. There's Radio City Music Hall. There's Thirty Rock. You wow. know, I got in front of Thirty Rock and panned up just like the beginning of the Look thing. The show, like, yeah. There we go. So it's nice, all there. Nice. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, watched a couple movies. Um, watched the uh, Star Wars sequel trilogy. So um, you know, seven, eight, and nine. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that that kind of left me with a funky feeling, Brian. And hmm. as a nerd, I like to kind of you know get obsessive with my nerdy hobbies, like Star Wars, like no, like really? Marvel stuff. Yes. <laughs> However, in order for me to be nerdy on the internet about mm -hmm. these things, I then am subjected to like memes and jokes and criticisms of these things. Right. And I don't want to be subjected to that at all. Yeah, like ruins the fun. It, I, I enjoy, like I'm watching these movies, you know, and these new Star Wars movies. One was directed by J.J. Abrams, then Ryan Johnson, then J.J. came back to do the other one. Right. And it's a well-known fact that they did not have a unified vision for the trilogy right. so it's a little disjointed there's some plot holes and some contradictions and stuff like that sure. um and i don't want to know about that mm -hmm. i really don't like i, I just want to be able to enjoy the yeah, movie. ignorance is bliss it really is mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about like silly nerdy stuff like star wars and marvel like i don't need to hear about criticism we're talking star wars and superheroes man like that's all made up anyway it's and then in your comic books are the same way like i don't care about Oh well, this artist, you know, left this company to go here. Like, I don't want to hear about any of that. I just want to mm. enjoy my nerdy stuff, and I just I wish there was a way I could be online in these environments mm. where I can celebrate and enjoy these things without hearing about the nitpicking and the complaining all the time. Because mm. I because even if you don't agree with it, and I don't, I think all the Star Wars movies are awesome. I think all the Marvel movies are awesome, like in their own way. Like none of them. I don't have a single thing to complain about in mm. most of them. Mm. Still don't like Jar Jar Binks, but whatever. Um, but that's the thing. It's <laughs> not like, a on that one. But yeah, but yet, even if you uh, don't agree with it and don't really let it into your head, the memory, is, the reality still stays in there. I'm like, yeah. I just don't want that. And, mm. and I feel like the internet just, you know, you can't get away from it. Mm. You can't just enjoy the things. You can't just hear about the happy parts. And... I really wish that was not the case. That is tough. Yeah. So that was a bummer, you know, because I'm watching these things and I'm, I can't help but think like, oh, yeah, I remember Mark Hamill did that interview where he didn't agree with the direction that Luke Skywalker was taking. Like, I don't want to know that. Uh, I got the burden of knowledge. Right. Yeah. Like, I don't want I would enjoy these movies. If the Internet didn't exist when these movies came out, 
it'd be fine. They'd be like, mm. ah, cool, it's more Star Wars movies. Hmm. And that'd be, that'd be that. Like the, 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 um, the prequels came out when we were in high school and sure. a little bit after yeah. we had gotten out of high school. There mm-hmm. were criticisms, of course, but social media oh, yeah. didn't exist. Right. So the criticisms were just like, you know, chatting at the lunch table about it. Right. And that's fine. I can deal with that. Right. You, you, can, you can remove yourself from those conversations easily. Mm-hmm. But the internet it totally changed it. Now, you know, everything is just the negativity so far outweighs the positive passion. Mm. And it's just sad. You know, it just kind of, especially when it affects the things you really, really love and the things mm. that used to be, you know, a happy place for you to go and chill on your week off. Mm. Now I, my brain is, you know, repeating these memes and jokes and criticisms in, in my head. And I just want to, I want to erase it. Mm. So love Star Wars, love those sequel trilogy. I but, wonder if uh, it's, so again, this is, <clears throat> I'm like a casual watcher of some sci-fi fantasy type things, but I'm by no means a fan. And I have not seen most of these. I haven't seen any Lord of the Rings. I haven't seen any Harry Potter. I mean, it's the same It's the same with any fandom, really. Yeah, you know? but I, I would have to imagine. Except for fountain pens. Like Y'all both, agree. both the enthusiasm for these worlds, mm-hmm. for lack of a better term, plus the fact that they are completely made up makes me wonder if they're just open to that much more criticism because it's not necessarily like grounded in yeah. like an actual reality. Right. It's grounded in a fabricated world, a mm. fabricated reality. So then there's all this argument about what's real for that environment, that yeah. world, but it's all made up anyway. Yeah. So it just, to me, it just seems like very ripe for yeah. controversy and debate and yeah and i and i and i like the the older i get and the more i just desperately want to just be left alone and enjoy my stuff i mm. adopt that mindset I'm like it's all made up anyway like don't worry about it like it just if just just watch it or not you know and yeah i don't know it's just it's i i, I just i experienced this a little bit because joseph joseph loves lego mm-hmm. he always has yeah. he is kind kind of a fan of star wars though he hasn't he's only seen the original four, five, and six. He hasn't seen the prequels or the, uh, has he seen? No, I don't think he's seen the prequels or the whatever. Um, maybe he has, I can't remember, but either way, he's not like a diehard fan of star Wars, but he loves star Wars Lego. Yeah. And he has observed this even in his preteen and teen years with the debate about the Lego adoption for the characters and all this and how the helmet didn't have this piece and that. And, And I'm just like, yeah. He, he gets kind of annoyed by that. Too. Yeah. And like, you can't yeah. get away from it. You can't be a fan yeah. and not have these things in your ear. Mm. And I, after I watched these movies, which are heavily criticized, I watched it. I'm like, these were great. These were fun. Yeah. They're Star Wars. They're movies. They yeah. look fun. I had a fun time. And I would have had more of a fun time if mm. I didn't have these voices in my head. Hmm. And I just, yeah. it's just not fair. Anyway, that's my little, okay. that's my little thing. Um, but okay. uh, sorry you experienced that. That's okay. I'm still gonna. It's not taking away my love. It's just kind of like making me, you know, I, I, I just am constantly, you know, adopting mm. more strong mindsets as far as you know, living a life where I don't yuck anybody's yum. Hmm. You know, well, a good idea. It is in general. It is. You know, it is especially on the internet. People are just yucking yums everywhere. Uh, Thanksgiving was nice. Uh, went over to my grandmother's house like I've done my whole life, except now, you know, with my grandfather having passed away, she moved into a uh, townhome and, you know, mm-hmm. it's a smaller experience, but it's still the same, still yeah. great, still, you know, healthy family dynamic and mm. um, we're all happy to be there. I took care of uh, the uh, all my gift buying, all my Christmas gifts. So, oh, wow. Uh, okay. Archer's taken care of, Shannon's taken care of, and my family, we just do a stupid little like $15 white elephant thing. So. Yeah. You know, nothing stressful there. So yeah, we don't do a whole lot. No, with our, it's like, pretty easy with like my siblings, in-laws, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's really all about the kids at this yep. point. Yeah. So I was happy to have everything taken care of there. I decorated. Um, we uh, got up in the attic, got everything out of there. Got oh, okay. the, got the tree up. Got all the outside decorations taken oh, wow. care of. You're ahead of me, man. Yeah. Well, last year I did it before Thanksgiving. Wow. This year I did it. You know, Thanksgiving weekend. So yeah. all right. But I got it done. Um, I no matter I do the same thing on the outside of my house every year. And every year I have the same amount of extension cords and I'm like, all right, where did anything go? I have no memory year <laughs> to year and I have to figure it out all again. Mm. I probably do them different ways every time too. Probably. And I'm like, last year, I feel like 
I feel like I didn't have to use this one last year, but I'm definitely gonna have to use it this year. And <laughs> and I had to I had to go get a, an additional one this year. I'm like, I know I didn't use didn't need all these last year. What changed? I have no idea. Mm, I just did just did it wrong. I'm sure. Yeah. But whatever. Got that done. You should take a picture of it before you take it down. That way you know what you did. I should. Yeah. But you won't remember. No, I won't remember to look. <laughs> um, right. Tonight, uh, we are going to go. Uh, we've got a friend coming to watch Archer, and we're going to go out to an Italian restaurant for a date night, and we're going to go Ooh. see Shannon's favorite musical artist, Sarah Brightman, in a uh, oh. concert here downtown Richmond. I'm familiar with Sarah Brightman. I didn't know so, she was in town. She is indeed. That's pretty She's cool. She's in Richmond tonight. And uh, Shannon has been a li- has been a lifelong Sarah Brightman fan. Phantom mm-hmm. of the Opera, you know, with yeah. Sarah Brightman was the thing that got her singing in the first place. That's awesome. So um, this will be her third time seeing Sarah Brightman. Wow. Um, my cool. first time. Um, okay. But uh, she's always been super passionate about it, so I'm really excited to share this with her. It'll so be a good show, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. She puts on she's a phenomenal. You know, big performance, a lot of That's fun cool. and cool effects. Yeah. Nice. Um, so we're going to do that. And then um, this is actually, uh, you know, it's, you know, my world's pretty, pretty standard, but uh, this is my wife's last week at her current job where she's working from home. So she'll be taking a new mm. job next week, going back into an office. And uh, so my my lunch breaks will be minus one human, so it'll just be yeah. me and the three dogs. You and the dogs. So you yeah, that, that that's bittersweet. She's going to be happier, but it was mm. nice to have lunches with her every day. Yeah. But I'm glad I did it. Every day I'd go home um, over the last two and a half years and have lunch with Shannon. So mm. it was nice while it lasted. But uh, she's an extrovert, big time, and yeah. working from home and having to have that's full tough. conversations with you know hairy potatoes that bark constantly is just not <laughs> not filling her meter so yeah um which makes her far less tolerant to staying inside on weekends by the way right that it's, makes sense then. she's like y'all we cannot and me and archer are like no i just want to lay around Can we just? <laughs> she's like no i need to go somewhere i need to get out of the house i need to yeah. see people so i think this will be a better fit for her but uh that's good that'll yeah. be the next kind of big yeah, thing exciting. happening yeah, yeah. And life change yes that's indeed cool. new chapter that's cool yeah that's it for me very cool um yeah we had thanksgiving too i had we had a lot going on we had rachel's whole family sounds like it her parents and her sister's family so there's 10 of us in the house which is not insane but definitely busy not so when you say 10 of us in the house you mean like staying overnight in the house yeah they were there for a week yeah 10 for a week 10 of us for a week oh yeah so 10 people's dishes 10 people's laundry 10 people's sleeping arrangements and towels and everything it was it was a lot it was a lot going on and my niece and nephew they're uh five and eight you know so they're like they're not like toddlers running around any you know anymore it was a little crazier a couple of years ago because they were basically uncontrollable how many times did rachel need you like just go hide in a room somewhere oh, i was like on the regular yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be me on the regular i'd be like hey brian which which shed is the nice shed i'm gonna go in there <laughs> yeah <laughs> which one has the tiles <laughs> yeah definitely but you know it was nice like in the past, when you, you know, whenever you have any kind of get together with family or friends, you know, even if you get along really well, after a week, you're kind of like, all right, oh, yeah, we're ready for this to be over and kind of needing a break. But we really didn't get that this time. It was like we were all just vibing. Wow. It all worked out pretty well. Okay. So that was really cool. Um, it worked out well. So they've got a tradition um, from Rachel's side of the family that. Um, Thanksgiving is like a really big deal. They've got recipes passed down from Rachel's grand, great grandmother, I think some of the, some of the recipes. Oh, wow. So it's like multi-generation passed down. And it's this thing where we cook the stuffing inside the turkey. We use the liver from the turkey to make a roux for the gravy. And it's a whole thing. Oh my gosh. I don't, so it's like, I was wondering if anybody still puts stuffing inside the turkey. Oh Yeah. It's oh, a thing. It's okay. a thing. So Rachel's parents have been doing that for forty-two years or something like that. I feel like in, I feel like <laughs> the next generation is just not going to do the turkey thing. It seems, well, it's, it's going out. <clears throat> I don't know. We did it. Yeah. And, oh yeah. No, uh, it's still it's still a thing. But I think it's yeah. like you know, Rachel and her sister though they didn't uh, they didn't really want to keep the tradition going. Kind of what you're describing is yeah. like yeah, it's kind of a lot. Well, a lot of people just but, are acknowledging that, that that turkey just is not that good like it's dry and difficult and oh yeah we joke that it's it's literally just like a, a gravy and stuffing vessel i will say for us. The, the reason i like turkey while I'm, i usually kind of argue in favor of turkey is because it is very absorbent for gravy because of yeah. it is it is so dry definitely it's like a gravy sponge see i'm a dark meat guy i love the dark meat. oh okay that's less absorbent yeah 
the dry yeah. stuff's the good gravy sponge. Well, I mean, you can still get plenty of plenty of gravy <laughs> on, the, on the dark meat too. Um, but it kind of works out because I love the dark meat and there's not as much of it. Yeah. Everybody else prefers white meat. So I get all the dark meat I want. There you go. Great. Um, yeah. So we did that 22 pound turkey, stuffed it full of stuffing, fit a lot of stuffing in there too. So it was really good. So um, my brother-in-law and I have essentially like taken, taken the torch from Rachel's parents. So they're, they're kind of ancillary to the whole operation at this point. In We've been, terms of cooking? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. So like my brother-in-law and I, we do the whole turkey and the gravy and the stuffing and everything. So it's pretty involved. It was like, you know, Thanksgiving Day is like pretty much centralized around that. Ooh. And then we always do the post day, Black Friday, we reheat stuff and we make another fresh batch of mashed potatoes and, you know, kind of do a, a Thanksgiving 2.0. Um, with the leftovers so ends up being pretty pretty much not exactly like the original but pretty solid sequel um so yeah very involved around the whole meal thing that's awesome you know we're just now getting to the tail end of the the stuffing and the well the stuffing was long gone but today i made myself a little like kfc bowl i had some like the last of the mashed potatoes i had turkey in there I had a little bit of the green bean casserole, a little bit of that left. And then I had a little bit of the sliver of the can, you know, cranberry sauce. Yep. We do that and we do the cranberry orange relish. We had right. both versions. Nice. So how do the kids do with Thanksgiving? Are, are your kids picky about Thanksgiving food? They've gotten better. Archer just ate five rolls. Yeah. The kids love the rolls. They love yeah. mashed potatoes, some turkey. That's about it. No, Archer didn't. Corn. They no. love corn. He, he had like a tiny bit of cranberry relish and five rolls that, that's it yeah the kids are always picky but yeah. honestly in our family we're like well we don't care more for us yeah like <laughs> if y'all are gonna be picky whatever it's not about you it's about us family um so yeah that worked out pretty well um and then um we have not decorated everything for the holidays yet i know you usually don't decorate outside though right no because we live kind You're of in the, the woods, woods yeah. and there's like no point. Mm-hmm. Um, so we don't really do that. We might, I might throw some lights on our like swing set in the backyard because that we can actually see. That's cool. So we might do that if I feel like it. Um, but I tell you what we have done is we got out the winter birds. So um, Ellie, before all of our guests came, so this is the weekend before Thanksgiving, she wanted to get decorating. She was excited about starting it. So she, to her credit, cleaned up all the fall decorations. A motivated Ellie is one of, is like an unstoppable force. Yeah, she's got my my genes on that one. Oh my God. But here's what happens though. <laughs> so I got all the decorations out of the attic and brought it all downstairs. She put all the fall stuff away and she put garland all over the stairs and put out a couple of wreaths and we got the winter birds and that's it. There's now like bins of other decorations that have, have just been sitting in the hallway for all mm. week. And, you know, so she, she, I think she just doesn't quite know like what to do or how to decorate or whatever. So she, she lost some steam on it. Oh, so we'll get, we'll have to get it kicking up again this weekend. When, when, we'll do when, the tree and the whole thing. When capability know. meets motivation, she's going to be absolutely unstoppable. Yeah, absolutely. Like that. For sure. For sure. And to be fair, Rachel and I were not that motivated to help her. So she really was kind of on her own. Um, But I actually pulled out all of Rachel. Now, to Rachel, the the whole bird thing, if you haven't watched the Pencast as much recently, um, Rachel's become an unintended collector of these little birds that you get at Target. She admits it's intended now. It's now intended. Yeah. She bought some bird Christmas ornaments. So we'll now have Target bird Christmas ornaments, as well as she bought a couple more birds. But she, she's, I pulled out all of her birds that we have for our winter decorations. I want to know if there are more birds than is, hammers. Which is, oh, yeah, I think <gasps> so. As, as a whole, yeah, I think so. That's a flock. I, I'll have to count. I forget what it was, but it's definitely over 20 winter birds. Okay. Don't you have like 40 hammers though? Yeah, but there's four seasons. Oh, she has multi seasonal birds. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. She's got summer birds and spring birds and fall birds and all that kind of stuff. So I'm talking just you don't, you don't have, she breaks out like Christmas birds 
she's like, but these are both Christmas birds and winter birds, mm. like non-Christmas birds. Mm. And I'm like, isn't that all sort of the same thing? Like it's all just winter, you know? So that's how she justifies having well, like 20 I, plus I will, winter birds. I will say I have, I have like Christmas sweaters and ho- and, and winter sweaters. Like this, what you're wearing, yeah. that's- that's It's winter. Yeah, absolutely winter. Yeah, this is good to go. Like it doesn't have Christmas trees on this it. This one, I would also wear all winter. But if it's got like, if it's like mm-hmm. red and green, I retire that after December. Yeah. Um, so here's a picture. Those are her winter birds. Okay. So that's probably a good 30 it's a, birds. It's a good, yeah, it's pushing 30. Yeah. Pushing 30 birds, you know? And some of them are smaller and all that kind of stuff. And to be to be clear, like I'm not mocking her or anything. Like I bought her some of these birds this season. Yeah. Because she wanted some birds and I was like, heck yeah. Like she works really hard and doesn't really... I have so many obscure collector-based hobbies. I'm like, honey, if you want these birds, just buy as many as you want because they're cheap and they bring her joy. The kids love them. And I love sticking them in random places around the house. Just this morning, I took one of the birds off the end table and I stuck it in one of the wreaths and I'm just going to wait and see how long nice. it takes her to notice. She won't watch this, so she'll never know. Archer and I have something <laughs> similar going on, but it's with a squishy turd with eyes. It's like a, not not an emoji, just like a, some, I don't know who got it for him. Probably okay. some aunt. And, <laughs> and he just, he put it on my pillow um, yesterday. Yeah. Okay. So that was hilarious. <laughs> nice. I put it in his sink this morning. Oh, there you go. So. That's fun. It is. You'll remember that for a long time. Yeah. Hiding That's a turd fun. around the house. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Seasonal. Of all the intentional things that you'll do to try to like make memories with him, he won't remember any of that, <laughs> but he'll remember things like the turd. Yeah. I'd be like. They're like, dude, we took you to Disney three times. Like, yeah, but remember that turn? Like, oh my God. That definitely is true. Oh, you're right. My kids don't remember hardly anything from the Disney trips we've done. I know. Neither does Archer. Shannon was telling me the other day, because we have a trip planned for February, and she was like, I hope hope he like reacts more this time. I'm like, honey, don't. He's not. Don't count on it. Like, he will get more excited about like, uh, you know, if us, if a free thing comes in a food item that he wasn't expecting yeah. rather than us like saying, Hey, we got you this big thing for Christmas. We like, yeah. oh, that's okay, cool. Thank you. you know. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, so anyway, we got the birds. I'm fully encouraging Rachel to lean into the birds. So we have birds all over the place now. Bird enabling. Like, she, we have two and she, we stopped at two. This was like 10 years ago. Oh no. We're like, Oh, oh, you're in deep. We're acquiring at least two every season. Oh, yeah. From now on. You're deep in the bird demic. We are. Rachel's like, I don't even like birds. <laughs> it's not like she's a bird person. She just, these birds are cute. Um, so, yeah, we'll be doing that. Um, let's see here. I think I already mentioned the tenor sax, right? Did I yeah, bought you did. it? Well, I actually got it in. Because I think I bought it, but it was waiting for it to arrive. I think so, yeah. When we had the last pen cast. But I got it in. Yeah. I got it in Monday last week. I've been playing it. I returned the rental, so that thing's out of my life now. And the one I bought is better than the rental, so I'm glad for that. Um, Because I didn't do like, I did some research, but I didn't do, and I'm not even gonna say like what type I got because I'm not trying to open up Pandora's box (laughs) about (laughs) what sacks I got and all this kind of stuff. But I bought a sax, tenor sax, and I've been enjoying it. Nice. So yeah, I'm finding some some music apps and stuff like that that are just, you know, I, back in the day when I played, it was all sheet music. Oh, that's right. And now You've got so all, many more options. Now it's all digital. Yeah. And you can like, you know, there's tuners and metronomes built into my phone. And it's just like practicing now. Like I have video tutorials and, you know, I can play sheet music that auto scrolls with accompaniment and everything. And I'm like, this is, as a solo player practicing, like this is so much more enjoyable than just like playing a piece of sheet music. So where do you go to practice in a, in a house full of people? I play in my closet. Literally, I practice in my closet. Now I've got a, a, a somewhat of a walk-in closet. Yeah. So I can stand in there, but it actually kind of works because I've got my clothes and stuff kind of all around me. So it's actually really good acoustically because the sax is loud. Yeah. And in my, That's my closet, thing. I'm like, because I'm sure that you're like trying to be at least a little respectful, you know. I try, but I mean, I'm. It's a saxophone. You can only be. I'm not a professional, so yeah. I'm, I'm kind of honking away in there. Yeah. But, um, plus, it's kind of fun to play loud. Uh, you know. But uh, no, it kind of works because I'm kind of shoved in the closet and they can still hear me, but it's not like, oh my gosh, like I, they can't ignore it kind of a thing. Now, if I'm not in the closet, then they can definitely hear quite a bit. Once I get better, I'll 
feel better about practicing more out in the open. Um, but yeah, so I did that. My family wanted me to like pull it out and play some for them. So I did and it was fine. I haven't, I have not performed for anybody yet. Uh, so that was a first and I definitely messed up a lot more. And I was like, oh yeah, performing music is hard because if you make a mistake, you can't just like start over. You have to just keep going. And it's like, I mean, Shannon deals with this all the time as a oh, performer. Yeah. <clears throat> you just got to kind of roll the, with it. Yeah, the key is a, a good accompanist. Yes, who it, can like adapt and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, luckily yeah. she and, you know, our best friend Josh, you know, are, you know, two peas in a pod as far as that goes. That's he, great. he can always fill in her gaps. And that's great. I never know when she screws up. Yeah, that's that's. That's the thing is like any professional, like they're going to make mistakes, but it's just how good are they at hiding it? Right. Um, so yeah, that's been fun. So I've been playing that and pretty much been playing every day. Really? I was going to ask how yeah. often? Wow. Pretty much every day. Yeah. Because it's getting more fun as I'm getting better and it's kind of awesome. coming back. Yeah, what, what, have you been, what have been your favorite things to kind of play around on? Like, uh, like uh, you know, notes, tunes? Yeah. I mean, I've got some like, just like practice type stuff, scales and things yeah. like that. They're just like the fundamentals that I'm doing. What's the most um, fun thing that's like? You're like, oh, okay, this sounds fun. Like I had, a, I had a little bit of a I mean, fun time on that. I got the Pink Panther song. Oh yeah, which is like made for tenor sax. So I've been playing that. Yeah, um, been playing Take Five. I'm playing some like jazz standards. The jazzy That's stuff cool. is is a lot of fun. But you can do the Pink Panther um, thing pretty pretty well. Yeah, yeah, nice. I'm, I'm getting, pretty much getting that one down. That's cool. I yeah. was actually talking to my cousin at Thanksgiving um, about. Uh, he was saying something about saxophone i'm like wait you play saxophone he's like yeah i was in marching band i'm like oh oh yeah my little cousin who was uh yeah. see, he was born in 2000 um oh he, he 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 had he still has his tenor sax actually that's awesome um so yeah he can still play but i'm like oh yeah well my, my brian will i just got that's one heck of those yeah, man. so he's like oh yeah i can go get it right now I'm like no nah, it's okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's right thanksgiving we, we don't need it <laughs> yeah um that's really cool um but yeah so it's fun uh, yeah, and I've been playing like, yeah, Take Five is a good one. Summertime by Gershwin is really good. That one's slower, but it's got a lot of soul to it. Nice. So, yeah, I would play more. Oh, I played uh, Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi. Nice. Ellie loves that song, so she'll sing along and I'll play it, and it's pretty fun. Um, you know, stuff like that. I got a couple of Sousa marches, which are fun, because I used to play, I played in the regimental marching band at mm -hmm. Virginia Tech. Um, I played tenor sax. That's where I learned. And so playing that stuff is like, oh man, like it's like a throwback. I remember like marching around in uniform to that. And it was like, yeah, it's a very different style than like jazzy stuff or like rock, rock stuff. So yeah, it's been fun. So yeah, just practicing all kinds of random stuff, whatever the heck I feel like. That's because awesome. I'm so glad you're doing, doing that. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Rekindling my older self, younger self, whatever. I mean, as far as like, you know, in the last couple of years, you've jumped back into doing woodworking more? Because there mm -hmm. was a gap there where you just were not doing any woodworking. Oh, I had no hobbies whatsoever. Right. And there's business and kids and that's it. Right. So you jump back into woodworking, mm -hmm. you got your little shop set up. Yep. And, you know, so you got that kind of gap filled mm -hmm. in. But the music gap, which is also a big part of yeah. your passion and hobbies, that has been absent for a mm -hmm. while. So now you filled that in. It's like yeah. you must feel like a more complete person because you'd had these hobbies that you were once yeah. very passionate about and were mm -hmm. big parts of you know, who you were and yeah. now they're both filled in like that. Like, how does yeah. that feel? feels awesome. I bet. Yeah. I can imagine. Well, it's like, I mean, probably same reason you play video games or well, like you do. That, you that's it. With me though, I've never had an absence of that because all of my hobbies were very mm. easily attainable and they never okay. left me. Gotcha. But like, you know, when I talk to my, mm. you know, artistic friends, which you right. could argue both woodworking and, you know, sure. musicians are, yeah. you know, that those are both artistic. A lot mm -hmm. of art is not as quickly attainable if you wanted to just jump into it, especially mm. you know, like with performing. So, you know, in, in yeah, any of my performing friends- Performing arts are tougher, yeah. Performing arts or just, you know, just even even uh, depending on what medium it is, if it's painting or something like that, it's mm. like y you have to be, it's much more of a mental thing. Like with mm. me, all my things are like, you know, very task oriented. Mm. I don't have to put forth a lot of effort to do a lot of my tasks. But mm. with when you're dealing with art and creativity, that's a very different thing. It requires so much more of the individual mm. to, you know, immerse yourself in this thing so that you can enjoy it, so that you can fill in these gaps in yourself. Mm. And like, you know, to, to you know what you've experienced, like it mm. sometimes takes years to get back into it. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I feel sorry for a lot of people who have a hard time getting back into it because I know what it feels like to have a gap, you know, yeah. um, well, I don't know what it feels like. I, I understand and can empathize yeah. what it feels like 
And I don't want that for anybody because, you know, you yeah. know, having an artistic hobby is a beautiful thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, therapeutic thing, mm -hmm. um, which I know I don't doubt you're getting some of that benefit That's as well. part of where it got it all started yeah, again. So yeah, so I'm just, I'm sure. just really, really happy for you, yeah. genuinely. That's cool. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun. Yeah, I, don't, I have no idea what I'm going to do with it, but I'm just playing it to enjoy it. That's, that's literally it. That's, hey, man, that's art. Yep, that's right. Um, and then I had my uh, my in-laws here, both on the my Rachel's sister and her family, then my Rachel's parents as well. Um, so I got to do all kinds of random stuff. Of course. Because they live more in like a truly like suburban, you know, like Northern Virginia it's much more like DC metro area, a lot more traffic, like smaller, like lots and stuff like that. We got a bit of land, so I can do all kinds of random things like uh, archery. Uh, Rachel's dad does some archery. He bought a good bow a few years ago. Um, he's been doing that. So one of the projects that we did was we built an archery target. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I bought some hay bales a couple of months ago and we were using that. But the problem is like hay is organic and it sort of breaks down and, you know, there'll be like spots that are like softer and the arrows will just like go right through. Yeah, That's kind of annoying. So we were doing some research like to actually buy commercially made archery targets are really expensive. I looked at buying one for archer. The, the yeah. cheapest one I could get was one of those like, what the, it was like one of the yellow and red ones. It was like 75 bucks. Oh, well, the ones we were looking at were like like three, four feet in diameter. Mm. They can get to like four or $500. Oh. Like it's crazy. So we were just doing some YouTube research and it was like, there's gotta be, there's gotta be cheaper ways to do this. These are, you know, we're not trying to hunt or anything. These are just for fun. Yeah. You know, I get crappy target arrows. I don't really care, you know, what it is that they're shooting into. So we found somebody that built like a, basically like a plywood frame and then like cardboard backing and filled the whole thing with basically like plastic grocery bags and like plastic tarps and stuff like that. Huh. And I was like, hmm. I was like, well, I have scraps of wood for sure. I'm sure you have plenty and of tarps. I have plenty of tarps. And, you know, whenever we get plastic grocery bags or whatever, I save them all and, you know, usually recycle them. But I hadn't done that in a while. So I'd gathered up a bunch. And so um, I also had some like boxes that I had bought for tools and they had like the styrofoam in there. And I was like, oh, that fills space. Essentially, I'm just trying to find void fill that will mm -hmm. you can shoot an arrow into and stop the arrow. So what so is the fill in this whole thing. so that's what the inside is made out of? Yeah. What's the outside made of? The outside is like a plywood frame. So you shoot into plywood? No, the plywood is just the edge. So imagine like the sides and the top are right. plywood, and the front is cardboard. Oh, so you shoot through the cardboard. You shoot through the cardboard. So you have to replace that fairly often. Then. Yeah. Okay. And and what I've seen other people do is like they'll put cardboard and then they'll wrap it in like a tarp, like an outdoor tarp or something. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, if you shoot it a lot, eventually you'll get holes in it and stuff like that and you'll have to replace it. But I mean, I have so much cardboard in my life. It's not a problem. Yeah. So yeah, we ended up building that. That sounds awesome. Yep. And I attached the whole thing onto a pallet. So I've got a tractor with pallet forks. So whenever I need to, because nice. the thing weighs like hundred pounds now, so I can't just like lift it. But whenever my father-in-law comes to visit or if the kids want to shoot their little bow, I can just fork the thing out into the middle have of the yard, ever, pop uh, it in there. Have you ever run over an arrow with the lawnmower yet? Um, I definitely have because my father-in-law lost one in the yard like four years ago. But then I found it earlier this year. Was it still intact? Yeah. All right. Because I was about to say, like, if you're shooting it, it, it from shot. eye level, you know, it's not oh, going yeah, to get hit by the lawnmower. It was like down in the dirt, yeah. basically. So like I'd driven over it probably a hundred yeah. times. But yeah, we found that sucker. Nice. So. I mean, you can you can put up you know sheets and stuff to catch them, but that's yeah. a whole you need to build well, a massive why, frame for that. That's why we made a bigger target, so the odds of not hitting it or go down a lot. So, yeah, yeah, that that's works awesome. Well. Yeah, go and now I buy arrows that are like bright green and stuff like that, so they're a lot easier to find. Um, so we did that, so that was fun. I say just go with flaming arrows. Oh, that's that's that'd be uh, great with a cardboard target one, filled with void filled with, fill filled with plastic. Yeah, <laughs> that would really go well. Um, yeah, we did some trail work a little bit. Nice. They don't get to do that very often, and I do it all the time. And they're like, "Oh, let's go on the trails," and I'm like, "Great! I'm excited to have somebody else want to go on the trails with me." So that was cool. We did some RC. Take car. a weed whacker with you. I know, right? Um, we did some RC car. Did some hatchet throwing. Wow. Got to do all the. All the old Brian this standbys. Is like, this is like going to like some like retreat for them. It really is. They actually said that. Like yeah. to walk on the trails and all that kind of stuff. They love like my my in-laws, my parents were like, 
genuinely they were like we feel like we're at a retreat here and i was like awesome that's so amazing I think that that helps you know with like not feeling old especially because like people can walk outside the weather was pretty nice mm -hmm. there was like one day of rain but the rest of it was pretty nice so yeah it was nice everybody got to do all kinds of activities um and then i did some more woodworking as well making some pen stands for various like people for you know christmas gifts and stuff like that so um got to get my woodworking fix and yeah, just all the all the brian classic yeah. hits that doesn't know? sound that doesn't sound like that sounds very fulfilling like busy but good busy yeah, it wasn't stressful. It yeah. was like, hey, what should we do? And it was kind of like, you know, they wanted to build some stuff or, we, you know, we played some chess. We did, you know, some various things, various activities, that depending on who was kind of into it. We watched the Barbie movie because they hadn't seen that. We watched the Mario movie because uh, my in-laws hadn't seen that. So, you know, just all the stuff that like some family members had seen or done something, but we hadn't done it all together. So it was just, it was just nice to have a whole week of that. Very so, cool. yeah, overall, very good week. Nice. Glad yeah, to hear it. Very busy but not stressful yeah busy. Not that's like, what it sounds like not like work busy you know um yeah so that's pretty much what's been going on in my world and then yeah that's it all right cool um we got some company updates here and then we'll uh, wrap this sucker up all right well we have one video here because we were off last week excuse me did not publish any videos um but we have uh another one how to troubleshoot a nib video which drew. specifically about uh, feedback and scratchiness it's going to be yeah. the first in a three video series about troubleshooting mm -hmm. so drew and our customer care team have both like worked pretty hard to um put something together that is informative but not like overwhelming amount of information it's pretty simple that's a, that's a hard needle to thread sometimes it is i i wanted to get more in depth but i wanted to make sure that it was comprehensive for yeah. someone that isn't already very well immersed yeah so that should be good. Um, we got that and then um, have a what's new video as well. So check that out because right. we've had so much new stuff coming in. Uh, and then we're going to be taking off on the Pencast next week as well. Rachel and I are doing a little staycation. And because it's easier to take time off when I'm not here, Drew's yeah. also taking off. So like, why not? Um, I think we'll still publish another the next video in the other um, series. But uh, yeah, we'll be having a little lighter week. So just enjoying a little downtime. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I think for the moment, um, we had a good successful black Friday event, cyber Monday, cyber weekend, whatever it's called. I don't yeah. know what it's called. Anymore. Th thank you to, uh, but. whomever decided to support us with it's, it's noticed and appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah. The team has been working hard by the time you're seeing this video, I anticipate we'll be all caught up and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully you enjoy your new fun stuff. Yep. So all good things. All right, let's wrap it up. <clears throat> I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know down in the comments how we're doing. Ask us some questions. Uh, you can check out GooliePens.com, our self-sponsor for fountain pen ink, paper, all that kind of stuff. Um, like and subscribe, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all these places. And I have a random fun fact for you. I would love to hear it, Brian. This is about um, Christmas lights because this is the, the season when everybody's decorating their house. Tis. Um, so, you know how in... Uh, Christmas vacation, Clark Griswold talks about his 25,000 Italian imported lights. Well, it got me curious. What is the world record for the most number of Christmas lights on a residential household? And I found the answer as of 2021. I didn't see anything more updated, but I didn't search, but so much. So according to first page of Google, um, Grace and Timothy Gay in New York Hold the world record for the most Christmas lights on a residential property. 686,811 lights, which they have set to music with over 250 choreographed songs. Um, so they uh, apparently have had at least 19 marriage proposals happen in front of their house because it's so uh, eventful, I guess. Uh, and what's really cool is they work with uh, their local fire department and other various like charities and stuff. And they rave, they have raised, f at least as of this 2021 20, article, uh, over $500,000 in total for charity, mainly for um, families that have lost their homes due to fires. Do they like charge for you to come look at their house? Or is it I, like a donation box out there? It was kind of light on the details. I'm huh. not sure about it. I think they have a website that maybe you can donate through. I'm not sure. But oh. just, I guess, somehow the exposure and maybe they That's charge, awesome. I don't know. Use yeah. your platform for some good. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of neat. But I wanted to 
get more information, but I just didn't, couldn't find it. Like, what is their electric bill like with 686,000 lights? I don't know, man. It must be a lot. Yeah. Probably in the tens of thousands. I would imagine. Because I mean, to 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 win a, to have a world record like that on a residential property, you can't have a tiny home. Like I'm sure they don't live in a container home. To no, I don't like, think so. You have to have a sizable enough property to fit all of so. that stuff. Like a good amount of yard, and yeah. at least a you know decent size. Yeah, home. there's there's videos and stuff. Just look look Google these people. You'll you'll definitely find it. But it looks pretty unbelievable. So yeah, kind of interesting. And something here in Richmond, Virginia, where we are. They have something called the Tacky Lights Tour, which is like a like recognized thing. They've had like TV shows and stuff about it, and it's like a whole thing. Is that just in Richmond? I thought everybody, every place had one of those. It's definitely like a Richmond thing. Oh. I don't know. I'm sure they have them elsewhere, but it is like Richmond is known for doing it. Oh. And apparently if you're like on the tour route or whatever, mm -hmm. when you buy a house, it's like in your like – house whatever hoa mortgage whatever the heck it is that you're like part of the tacky light tour and you have to decorate your house for the the tour that's like you're signing up for that by living in that area or whatever that's what i've heard so kind of wild but you know, no stranger to to big crazy wow. lights in richmond here there, there's one, one of the larger ones in the area is uh close to my house it's the one that's near um uh you know we have a coworker who has lived right across the street from one that was featured on, you know, TV somewhere. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, we usually pop by and see that one. Yeah. But, uh, I've sure. done, I've done a tour one time and it was not our favorite thing. Uh, mm. it was neat, but Shannon and I don't drink and it seemed like the purpose of the um, tour, like it was a limo, it was neat, but like right. everybody was just like getting sloshed. Yeah. We're just wanting to look at the lights. So we're, we're, we're lame. So, I thought yeah. about maybe one day splurging and getting a limo for just me, Shannon, and Archer. And just like, but I'm like, that's not, they don't care that much. You just need to like get a friend group together, people that aren't drinkers. Yeah. Or just, or just, well, this was years ago in our 20s. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm sure that that same group of friends probably practices more restraint these days. Probably. probably. There you go. Anyway, hope you all are having a good time so far this holiday season. We are going to be off next week, but then we'll be back after that. So hope this holds you over for two weeks. Thanks for watching and fight on.